Hello guys, this is Rupesh and you're watching CPP Nuts video series on C++ and today's topic is introduction to the threading in C++ or C++ 11 because this threading which is this thread header was not there before C++ 11. So if you want to practice this, you must have to have this C++ 11. Okay, so that was first thing. Second thing is this is not related to the OS threading. I mean how OS take care of threadings and how they are actually managed in processes, how they share the addresses and all that. This is really not about that. This video is about what do you understand by threading and give some example in C++. So this is actually a C++ threading. I mean, how you create threads in C++ and what benefits you get if you use that. So the answer for this question is not that simple, but I have tried to summarize it like in every application, there is a default thread which is main thread. Okay, so whenever you write some program like this, you have some main function and fr from here your program starts and it ends here. So whatever you write in between, if it is not threaded application, it will be a single threaded application because main itself is a single thread. I mean this function is not threading. I mean you can tell this function a single thread, obviously because OS runs this function and if there is no thread, this is the only thread. Okay, so that is the only thread if you don't have any thread. But if you want to create threads, you have to create that inside this main thread. Okay, so I'll explain what is threading. Uh, I cannot get the actual sentence how to explain that. I will explain with the diagram and calling uh, structure. So wait for some time. And lastly, we will see an example that you really get the benefit of using thread. Sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, why did my Alexa wake up? Alarm for what time? Sorry Alexa, I have to stop you. So where I was, yeah, I was talking about, lastly you will get the actual use case why you should use thread if you can, okay? We'll see the benefit. Your full program will run in half of the time how much it was taking before if you are not using thread. So let's move to the next point. A thread is also known as a lightweight process. So what is process? When you create an application or in hello world world, if you create a simple program like this, this is an application and a process. When you run this, this becomes process inside your operating system. And if you have not used any multi-processing or multi-threading stuff inside this, this is just one single process. Okay, so a thread is also a lightweight process. What is lightweight? Actually process itself is a little bit heavier because it has to have so many things. But if you are creating a thread inside a process, that thread is little bit lighter than the process because you don't have to manage different different stuff because threads actually run inside process. Okay, so you can assume that process as a big entity and threads inside that smaller smaller entities and the idea is to achieve parallelism by dividing a process into multiple threads so if you can create multiple threads i would say you should create and for the examples i have written few lines here the browser has multiple tabs that can be different threads so you see so many tabs right in browser they are different different threads if you will open different different tabs they all are handled by threads, okay? So second point is MS Word must be using multiple threads. One thread for formatting the text, another thread for processing inputs. So you might have used MS Word or something, any editor for sake, and you would have noticed that whenever you type something, it formats your text in some order, whatever order you have selected. So that is nothing but a thread which is running in the background and it is taking the input whatever you are writing and formatting it in some way or other. And another example is which is a very good example I used to give this example when I was giving interviews. This example is spell checker. You write something and it will pop up like oh you didn't write it correctly. So how that happens because you didn't press any button then who recognizes that you are writing something wrong or right. So it's thread which is running in the background and as soon as you write something and hit space it will check that particular word and find in the dictionary whatever it maintains whether 
it is correct word or not. So that is a good example of threading. So third point is Visual Studio Code Editor would be using threading for auto completing the code or it's called intelligence. So if you don't know what is intelligence, let me give you the example. So as soon as I start typing, see these options are coming, right? Like, am I supposed to write INC, include, intelligence, introduction? So these things are coming from some thread. The thread is taking my inputs, whatever I am writing here, and it is matching with its database. If it is able to find something, it is giving me the options here that whether I will be liking this one, this one, this one. So like this. Okay. So this is also a thread running in the background. Okay, then. So this was about uh, threading how it actually looks like. Okay. So you might have understood how thread actually works. I mean, in the Laman language, but we'll see the example, concrete example in a couple of minutes. Now, ways to create threads in C++. Actually, this topic is another topic. I mean, I'll create this topic after this video. There are actually five ways you can go in C++ if you're creating threads. So function pointer is the point we'll be looking here, but rest of these we'll see in the separate video because everything has its own syntax and that is really very important. So, so far so good. Now let's discuss the requirement. What is the requirement here so that we can create a program for that. So find the addition of all the odd numbers from one to some number. This is very good number. Actually it took so much time for me to find this number because it was not easy to find some number which is giving you the expected output what you want to show. Okay. And all even numbers from one to 10. So basically what I'm trying to do is find the sum of all the elements from start to end. Okay. So even sum and odd sum. And lastly, I'm just printing them. So these are the functions. This is start and this is end. Okay. And this U U I mean U L L is nothing but unsigned long and long. I have typed def it so that I don't have to write this again and again. So you can see highlighted places. I have to write these many places unsigned long, long. I would have grown old. <laughs> okay. Now, as you can see, this is fairly simple program and you know the working of this program. I know that really very well. You will call this function. It will be called with these two parameters. It will come here. It will do the job. I mean, it will do the sum, come back. Another function will be called. It will do its job and then it will come back and you will do this. So can you see a thread here? It is single thread. Let me give you an example here. So your program started from here. It saw that, okay, I have to run find odd function. Okay. It went to that find odd function, completed that, came back to this find even function. Okay. It has to go and execute that also. So it went and executed that also, but it came back again and then it executed these two and return. So can you see this? There is only one thread. There is nothing like it is running from here to here and something else is also going on somewhere in the background. No, nothing is going on in the background. So this is kind of a single thread. There is no parallel processing here or multi-threading here. So let's quickly run this program and see how it works. So this is the command for compiling this because I'm using threading here. So you have to write this P thread and std C++ 11. This is a very important point because you cannot have this threading until unless you compile it with C++ 11. So I have not written any threading, but still I will compile like this. It's okay. No problem. So I have compiled it. Let's execute that. Okay. So odd sum is this much and the one. Okay. So you would have noticed that it took quite amount of time for calculating this. That's what I needed. Now, if you want to know how much time it took, we can calculate that. So wait a minute, I will use something like this. So this is going to be your start time. Okay. So what we are doing is we are taking the start time when we actually want to measure the work here. After that, also we are doing the same thing and stop time doing the difference. And this is the difference. So let's print out the difference as well. So that printing will go here. Okay. So this duration is the result, how much time it was taken and count. And this is some number which will give you the seconds because this will give you maybe in microseconds. So 
converting that into some seconds okay i'm not that good in maths so leave it so this will give you the seconds so let me just write that seconds okay we'll compile this again we'll run this now it will give you the time it took to actually complete this calculation so it is taking four seconds okay good so i assume two seconds for this one and two seconds for this one i mean that's what it would have done so total four seconds so now keeping this as a benchmark we will see how we improve if we use thread so let's implement the thread now now concentrate here this is the syntax now i'm going to explain the syntax so now open up your eyes thread you have to write thread and t1 this is the name of your thread and you're done but thread needs a callable object that's what i said you need to have these things inside thread so that thread will run them so as i said we'll be using function pointers so i'm going to give function pointer here so first i will give find even and this is start and end okay and similarly thread t2 and this time find odd start and okay so this is the syntax for function pointer so if you will create a thread this is thread you have created it as soon as compiler oh, sorry operating system will run this particular line it will create a thread for you and that thread will run this function so threads needs functions callable stuffs like functor or lambda function or static or dynamic sorry not dynamic static member functions or not static member functions because it has to run something right so that's how it works and after defining what it should run you have to give the parameters so this is the parameter section you can give as many as you want there are a few points like if you want to pass these parameters as reference in the thread you have to use some std ref so we are not going to discuss all those things and the same thing goes with this one now as i said as soon as this is hit thread is created now there is something called joining the thread t1 dot join i won't talk about this join much because it will take so much time actually not so much time but i decided to make another video for this but for now you just understand that if you will not write this join these threads will not be joined to your main thread and they will be running and if your main thread goes off i mean if it is completed but your threads are not completed then there is no way to get the results of these threads okay because your main thread has gone so you have to join these thread with your main thread that's why you're writing t1.join and t2.join so what happens when you write this actually when your os is creating thread it will start running this function okay so it will actually call this function and come back and this function is keep on running and meanwhile it is back and it will create another thread so this will result into running this function and this will also come back i mean there is no single thread now i'll draw the diagram don't worry about that and they are continuously running and it will come i mean your program controller will come back and it will run this t1.join now you won't move further you will wait for the t1 to complete to go further okay and let me comment these two functions because now we are going to test these function with thread okay it's that simple threads are created now you are waiting for those threads and they are running in the parallel now there is no calling like find odd will be completed and it will come back and then it will call find even no they both are running in the parallel thread okay and we are waiting for them here so let's see what is the output now i will create a diagram don't worry so let me run this compile successfully run this and now notice the timing here it took two seconds same program we didn't do anything we just ran this find even and find odd in two different threads and as i said maybe this one is taking two seconds and this one is taking two seconds that's why we had to complete this one and come back and this one that's why it was four seconds but this time we were running this one and this one parallelly i mean these two functions parallelly so it took two seconds only you can understand that right and if you still find it difficult to understand 
let me give you an example with some diagram so as i said when you will hit this line i mean when your os will hit this line it will create a thread so instead of going to this function and waiting for this to complete it will go to that function and let's assume there is this find what is this even so there is this find even function and this is the function so what this thread will do okay you start so this function is actually running and it will come back while it is running okay it is occupying the processor and doing its job and your main thread is actually back and it will execute this one so this is also another thread calling so this will go to find odd function and let's suppose this is that function so it will start running this function so this function is also running and it will come back okay and this is also running and this is also running while this thread is doing all these stuff so it created this one first so it was actually running when it created this one so this one is also running now it came back and now this one was executed now as soon as it hits this join it will know that okay now i have to wait for this t1 to complete to move forward so your main thread is waiting for this find number to come back okay so actually it was running and it took maybe some two seconds and it came back and you have to wait for t2 also so this also took two seconds but as they were running parallelly both took two seconds together it's not two plus two because they were running parallelly so t2 has come so now you can move forward check the timings do all these stuff and you got the result so this is how it works you remember before you actually go to that function in this case you actually go to that function and be there till that is finished and you will be back i mean your control will be back to this main function and then you will go for this find even and that will also take two seconds and you will come back and do all these stuff so that's why it was two plus two but now in threading it is running parallelly so that's why it took only two seconds and i think this much is enough to explain how threading works so if you like the video don't forget to hit the like button dude it will help me a lot and if you have any suggestion or something most welcome and don't forget to see the next video which will be coming in maybe one or two days and that is about how many types are there to create threads in c++ so actually there are five types okay and we'll see all the syntaxes and it will be fun so i'll see you in the next videos bye bye don't forget to hit the like button guys love you bye bye hello friends this is rupesh and i'm watching cpp nuts video series on c++ and today's topic is type of thread creation in c++ 11 so this video is going to be a very basic video there will be talking about only how many ways are there you can create threads in c++ okay using callable objects so I hope you have watched my previous video which is about introduction to the threading there I have discussed few basic points and the reason why we should use thread if we can and there I used a function pointer okay so if you are coming from that video you must be knowing what is function pointer I mean how to call thread this is t and it's an object of thread type you are calling this function as a thread passing 10 as an argument okay so you might be knowing this very well but there are five different types you can create threads in c11 including this function pointer so we are going to discuss all those things here now there is a note here if we create multiple threads at the same time it doesn't guarantee which one will start first okay let's read this again if we create multiple threads at the same time it doesn't guarantee which one will start first what i mean to say is let's suppose you are having this stt thread t1 and you're calling suppose some function with 11 okay and this is going to be your thread 2 and you have this thread 1 copy paste thread 2 okay this is perfect code right so you are creating t1 t2 function and function so there are two threads creation here now what i mean to say is it is not guaranteed that t1 will create i mean it will be created first 
and then T2. No, sometime it may happen that T2 is created first then T2. Sorry, T1. Okay. So, as this is your first type of thread creation which is function pointer, you know very well like how it will work. You will create a thread. Let me just remove this T2 part here because we don't need this anymore. Okay. So, T1 will be created function name is used as function pointer because if you will write only your function name that is a function pointer and this thread will be created so it will print some 11 to 0 or 10 to 0 okay so this was the first type let's move to the second type let me just comment this so second type is your lambda expression okay you might have seen this already so this is your main function you have this lambda function and yeah actually you can initialize your lambda into some variable and you can give that variable here and this is actually similar to what we were doing here okay so instead of using function pointer we are using lambda function and the comment says we can directly inject lambda at thread creation time so when we're creating thread we can directly inject this part here itself so let's first compile this so this is the command compile it it compiled successfully now if you will run this let's see how it is working okay from 9 to 0 why because we are giving here 10 okay so this is exactly similar code to the previous one but here we are using lambda function so as i said we can directly inject this part from here to here okay just comment out this one so instead of function pointer you have written lambda itself inside thread creation time okay so let's compile this again voila it compiled execute same output okay so using lambda function you can achieve the same thing okay so this was the second point let's go to the third point third point is using functor i don't know you have heard about this or not but this is functor which is also called function object and this is how it is written so if you have class and you are overloading this operator then it is nothing but a functor and if you want to know about functors there is a video of mine you can search it you'll get it so as you can see that you have the similar code and this time your this particular function will be treated as callable object okay and this is how we call it and let me just save this and compile this again okay no problem compiling the same output okay so this is also giving you the same output so this was the third way of creating thread okay you're not passing function pointer you're not passing lambda function you are passing the functor here okay okay so let's move to the fourth one okay before that let's comment this this fourth one is a non-static data member sorry member function so this is how it would look like and yeah here comes the difference you have this base class and you want to call this function as your thread then you have to call it like this first you have to give the address of that function and then you have to write like base colon colon run because this run is inside your base class okay so you have to give this syntax and then address of that function okay and then you have to give the address of the object you want to call this function okay because this is non-static data member sorry member function so you need object to call this function so you are giving this object and then rest is the parameter part so if we, this run is expecting some parameter you pass it here so let's compile this save this and compile this okay no problem same output okay 9 to 0 so this is the syntax for non-static member functions let's move to the static one and complete this video static one would look like this okay you will do the similar job instead of passing object you will directly pass the argument because as this is a static member function you did not need any object but in previous case as this was non-static member function so in order to call non-static member function you need object so that's why you was giving the address of the object but in case of static member function you don't need any object to call this function right you directly call this 
function with this syntax so only function address is required so that's it i think we are done here next video is about join and detach because that is not simple thing okay because you've been seeing this join since long time but you might not be knowing so many things about it so i will give this video maybe tomorrow okay till then bye bye take care and if i miss something let me know in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like button guys bye bye hello friend this is rupesh and i'm watching cb winners video series on c++ and today's topic is use of join detach and joinable in c++ thread so if you're following my video series on thread you might be seeing me using this join but i didn't explain this much so today we'll see join and its counterpart detach and what is the use of this joinable here so let's look at the join nodes first it says that once a thread is started we wait for this thread to finish by calling join function on that thread object so let's write a program to understand this line here so if you are writing a thread you need a callable object so i can say that okay run and this is your function and this will just simply print rupesh okay cpp nuts and not only this let's do something else like take some count here while count tends to zero we'll print this okay so this is what your thread will look like and now let's create a thread so std thread d1 and here you will pass run and how many times you want to print let's make it 10 here and this is what the join is okay so let's save this compile and run so compiled it successfully compiled if i will execute it this will print this cpp nuts for 10 times okay this, that's it no problem so let's try to understand this join here as i said once a thread is started we wait for this thread to finish by calling join function on that thread object so what we are doing is as soon as you create a thread object by passing function and the parameter if you want to pass any parameter it will create a thread and it will start running that thread and the control will come back here so let's see that uh, let's print something here let's print main here main function okay and this thread is not a very big time taking thread so what i will do i will make this thread on waiting state so that we can assume that okay it is taking some three second or four second so std this sorry thread oh sleep for oh i keep changing my keyboard so this is not working chrono seconds let's make it sleep for three seconds so what it will do thread will start here it will come it will do its job and then it is sleeping for three seconds and we are simulating that this thread will do some job which will take three seconds so i'm putting this thread on sleep but don't think that it is sleeping we are simulating the behavior that it is taking some three seconds to complete some task okay so that we can see that it will actually wait here i mean your main thread will wait for this thread here and it will not go further okay so we can simply print main after okay sorry let's save this compile this and execute this see main came okay did you see that it was waiting for three seconds then only it printed main after okay so it was waiting here i can show you again let's clear this i will run this see it is waiting okay now it has come can you see that so what happened t1 is a thread it started this run as a thread and it came back printed main by the time this thread is starting because it is taking a little bit of time because thread is created using os so os is taking a little bit of time to start this thread by that time your main is back after saying to the os that okay you start this as a thread 
your main thread is back printed this main can you see that first it is printing main after printing main it is getting that okay t1 dot joint it means i have to wait for this t1 which is this thread but this thread will take at least three seconds after printing these 10 times it will take three seconds then only after this it is printing this one okay so this is the job of join the moment your program hit the join on some thread object it will wait there for that thread to be completed now you might be thinking what if i want to go further yeah that is the answer which comes with detach here okay so this was the first point i think you might have understood uh, let's give some five seconds i know it's clear but still i have compiled executed see we are waiting for five seconds yeah then only it is printing main after so we are waiting here for this thread and this thread was doing some great job which took five seconds so this was the first point now let's move to the second point double join will result into program termination okay what if i write join two times let's see that it will not give you a compile time error because syntax and semantics and everything is correct if you will run this see terminate call after throwing an instance of system error invalid argument whatever it is it is saying that two time join is not allowed and it doesn't make any sense because you waited for this thread to be completed at this line now again you are waiting for this thread to be completed because you are writing it and it doesn't make any sense because that was uh, completed before itself okay because you came out from this because it was completed and again you are waiting for this to be completed which doesn't make any sense that's why it's an error and it's a crash so always remember that you should not double join and third point is related to that only if needed we should check thread is joinable before joining using joinable function yes actually what happens sometimes you write this t1 dot join and after this you are writing so much of code okay here maybe 300 400 lines of code and after that maybe you happen to rejoin it you don't remember that okay i joined it before itself so the best practice is before actually joining what you should do is you should check if this t1 dot is joinable if yes then only you should join okay so let's compile this let me just give some little indentation here okay compile and execute this time it should not fail see it didn't fail okay even if you are written it it is not going there because it, this thread is no more joinable this is the use of joinable function so i think you understood this point also that you should always apply joinable before actually joining your thread and if you are writing very small program where you are sure that it is not joined before or you are not writing any complex program where you may end up joining again and again then in that case you can omit this okay so let's move to the detach nodes which says that this is used to detach newly created thread from the parent thread okay what is parent thread here this main thread okay let me remind you whenever you write a single threaded program i mean not using any thread it is a single threaded program okay which is a single process also so when you create some thread like this one you created here so this thread will become the parent thread for this one okay so that's what i'm saying here this is used to detach newly created thread from the parent thread okay we were joining now we were waiting for that let's not wait for that so let me remove all this extra stuff and if i will put this detach here then what will happen let's see and to demonstrate it a little better let's have this count also so that we can see how many times it is taking it i think it should be taking very fast but still let's give it a try okay nine to zero main main after can you see this program was completed and it didn't wait for five seconds can you see we we had this five seconds before and when we were waiting for this 
thread to complete it was waiting let me just run this again see it completed okay it is messing up now but that's okay this much behavior is acceptable in threading you don't know what will start first okay <laughs> but one thing is sure that you're not waiting for this thread to complete see it terminated right away and to show you that let's print something else uh, thread finish okay so if i will compile this run this okay this is some different output okay so let's try to understand why this is coming so it will clear up your few doubts see what happened when you created this thread t1 what happened the request goes to os os takes some time to create a thread and i mean take this function and create this function as a thread and then control will come back to this main thread and this is also running and this is also running correct then you will print this one and in os will run this thread but the time taken by os was little bit more than printing these two line on the console and your main thread was returned before actually os can start this thread that's what happened here because you have detached your thread you are not saying that wait for this thread to complete you are saying detach this thread from this main thread i no longer want to wait for this thread that's why you are not waiting for this thread and you don't care whether it is running or not so this is a really nice example okay so if i will run this again something else might come let's see no 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 okay why no okay before did you notice this came and after that nothing is coming so this is totally unexpected but actually it is expected it's okay actually your os is taking little bit of time for this before that you are actually terminating yourself and if you want to be sure for that uh, let's play some game here what can i do here um, um, um. okay let's take this one and place it here or here okay and command us and recompile and execute yay see now you're waiting okay so now understand this behavior what happened you created thread it was i mean the request was gone to the os and your control was back you printed this main here and after that you said okay i am detaching this thread from main that's okay till then actually os didn't started this because we have not printed anything from here so after detaching your main thread is printing main after till that time os could not start this thread because os is little bit slow as compared to printing these two lines and after printing this you are waiting i mean you are sleeping so your main thread is sleeping by that time 5 seconds is really very big number for os to start a thread so os started this thread and everything was completed and this thread finished was executed and your wait is finished and then you are returning from here so let's execute this again see you are waiting here for 5 seconds on this thread main thread and then you are done okay so let's command this and run compile this and run this again see <laughs> it is still giving you that output and let me re repeat this even started means you said to the os okay i want to start this as a thread os will take that request okay process it okay will understand okay i have to make some resources for this thread to be started by that time your control of main thread is back so you are printing this main th main to the console by that time os is doing its job to start this thread actually and then you did this t1 dot detach still os is processing this thread didn't started it yet and then you happen to print this also but still os is busy doing something could not start it and lastly you hit this return zero so you are gone from this main and os could not start this so that's why you are not getting any output from this thread and yes 
if you are detaching some thread and your main function is returned i mean completed your program is terminated this thread will no longer available it will be suspended okay because os keep track that okay from where this thread is coming even if you have detached it os will know that which one is the parent so if parent goes all the child goes automatically and maybe that's the point here if we have detached thread and main function is returning then the detached thread execution is suspended and the main point was always check before detaching a thread that it is joinable otherwise we may end up double detaching yeah that the same problem of double join we have the same problem with the double detach also because you may write t1 t1 dot detach and let's compile this and run this see it is again a crash it is aborting your program so double detach is also a problem so the simple solution for this is yes you will use joinable so if t1 dot join enable then only you detach and it makes sense right if you can join i mean if this thread is joinable then only you will detach it so let's mm, compile this execute this okay no problem so all these points are over now lastly let's look at this point either join or detach should be called on thread object otherwise during thread objects destructor it will terminate the program because inside destructor it checks if thread is still joinable if yes then it terminates the program so remember whenever you are creating some thread like this either you should write detach or join you should not just keep it like this no this is a problem why problem because in t1's destructor it will check whether this thread is joinable or not and if this thread is joinable it will terminate that at the moment only okay so this is very bad if you're not writing any join or detach so remember either you have to write join or detach if you are creating thread so let's complete this video thanks for watching if you like the video don't forget to hit the like button dude it will help me a lot and if you have any suggestion or if i forgot something to mention here please let me know in the comment section it will be very helpful for others to know the topic more detailed and we'll learn together so i'll see you in the next video bye bye hello friend this is rupesh and you're watching cvpnet's video series on c++ and today's topic is mutex in c++ threading or why use mutex or what is the race condition and how to solve it and what is critical section so we'll we're going to answer all these questions answer in this video so stay till the end and you'll enjoy this that's for sure okay so what is mutex mutex full form is mutual exclusion if you don't know what is mutual exclusion it means we will be accessing some thing mutually like first you access it then let me access that and then i'll let you access that and all that okay or if you want to know in hindi it's called samjhauta samjhauta in between two threads or more than two threads to access some common data okay if you don't understand this leave it we'll see the example and you will get it better okay so full form of mutex is mutual exclusion now there is a situation why we use mutex so let's discuss those situation then you will get to know that mutex part little well so there is something called race condition race means really actually race like car racing and all so there is a race condition but that race is to access the data okay and race means there will be at least two opponents or more than two opponents so at least two threads or two process should be there to actually raise for some data so let's suppose there is this data a common data for thread 1 this is your thread 1 and this is going to be your thread 2 and like this there can be many threads but we'll take simple example and thread 1 and thread 2 both are simultaneously trying to modify this data remember this until unless you modify the data there is no race condition you are just simply accessing the data there is no race condition if you are trying to modify the data then there is a race condition so let's look at this definition race condition is a situation where two or more threads or process happen to change a common data at the same time 
what I mean to say is let's suppose you have some variable integer x is equal to 0 there are two threads t1 and t2 they both are trying to change this x into something else maybe thread 1 and thread 2 both are trying to increment the value whatever is there inside x so currently we have 0 in x so t1 is also trying to increment x by 1 and t2 both are trying to increment x by 1 then in that case once both are done the result should be 2 right but the problem is there is a situation where result might not be 2 it might be 1 also so let's discuss that situation and that is actually the race condition okay so as I said we have this integer x here so let's have this t1 and t2 okay and do you know what instructions are used when you changed some variable I mean when you increment decrement or do some stuff on variables some assembly instructions are executed right so whenever you change some variable let's suppose you're doing some x plus plus so this is like x is equal to x plus 1 so how actually computer does this there are three things first is load second is increment and third is store so load means you will load whatever is there at x inside accumulator register do you remember your computer architecture class accumulator register is there where you bring all those variables and change that value and push it back so that's what happens so first you will load whatever is there inside x so x is having zero for now so what will happen when there is load let's suppose t1 and t2 happen to load at the same time so they loaded x means 0 and this also load 0 in accumulator register there is some accumulator register they are loading that 0 inside that accumulator register then they happen to increment the variable value so this increment happened and increment so the result became 1 at both the places at the same time because it is thread so it is possible that they will work together so it is possible that x is loaded together incremented together and then stored back so there is this third one store and store so this one will go to x at the same time so thread one is also copying 1 to x and thread 2 is also copying 1 to x so ultimately your x will hold 1 not 2 can you see the problem here this is called race condition you have two threads racing for this particular variable because this is common in between these two threads and I'm calling common again and again because it has very big significance because if some variable is not common in between two or more than two threads then there is no race condition for that if that variable is local to the each and every thread then there is no problem so till now we understood what is race condition so this is the race condition here is the race okay integer x is equal to 0 if you don't understand this let me give you the example here because I have the similar program here what it is saying is we have t1 and t2 thread add money add money is the function and both will start at the same time and add money will just increment my amount which is initially 0 so assume this is x this one okay so this is my amount which is shared between these two threads see add money and add money both are the same functions but they will run parallelly because they are injected into different different threads okay so add money will run for t1 and t2 both and we have a common variable for both the functions see this is a global variable that's why it is common for both if i will include this integer my amount inside this function then that is not common for both that will become individual for both the threads okay to make it common i made it global so here race condition is this much portion only this particular line not anything else only this line now as you understood what is race condition and yeah what is critical section this is what your critical section is 
this particular line is your critical section or you call it critical region also so this particular region is critical for you now here comes the mutex when there is a critical situation so or critical region or critical section here you go for mutex or semaphore but we are not going to discuss semaphore here so let's settle on mutex so how to solve this so for that i have to write a simple program for you and yeah before that what is this mutex mutex is used to avoid race condition obviously we will see that how it will avoid and we use lock unlock on mutex to avoid race condition okay there is something called try lock but uh, we are not going to use that because i think i will create another video for that so that being said let's create a program so as i said we will be using mutex so this is how we use it so std mutex m and there you go you have this mutex and then m dot lock and m dot unlock there you go so this is how you deal there had to be a mutex variable and that should be common for both the threads see this add money is a function which will be injected into the thread so this is nothing but thread two time but now we have mutex here so let's see how it will work but before that let's execute it and confirm that it is working fine okay we have does not name type mutex oh my goodness we don't have mutex in std why again okay. hash include mutex i missed that actually yeah okay so there is a header called mutex if you want to use mutex you have to include that so hit enter it compiled now execute it see you got two here now let's understand how this is working so as you all know that when we create t1 and t2 here it will create two threads first t1 and another will be t2 now they both will start parallelly let's assume they will start at parallel or same time so we have two threads they started together so they both will reach to this m dot lock at the same time let's suppose they are reaching at the same time but in computer there is a thing there is a cpu and t1 and t2 both are approaching to cpu and you are thinking it is approaching at the same time because you have written it like this but there is always a tiny difference between this one and this one you may call it 1000 or even bigger portion of 1 second i don't know why did i said that because i'm not sure how much time unit it is but what i want to tell you that is even if it looks like parallel but out of these two there is always one thread which reaches first than other one okay so let's suppose you are starting maybe t1 to t100 or 1000 or maybe 10000 if these threads are starting parallelly then either of these thread will reach to the cpu first or to say before others so in this case also either t1 or t2 will reach to the cpu first and by reaching to the cpu first means they will acquire the lock first so you have this mutex you will lock it either t1 or t2 will lock so let's suppose t1 happened to lock this mutex so let's suppose before this mutex was zero and t1 happened to lock it means suppose t1 changed it now it is used before zero means it was not being used now it is being used or it is being locked or actually it is locked so it is locked by t1 and t2 will also try to lock the same mutex but there is a situation it is already locked by t1 so this mutex i mean this thread will wait for this mutex to get free so this will go into the waiting or oh sorry it will be blocked so this t2 is blocked so t2's execution is blocked here only and t1 will move forward so as t1 got the lock and see we are guarding this 
critical region with lock and unlock. See, so before accessing the critical section, you must lock the mutex and after completing it, you should unlock it so that if is there any thread waiting for this lock, that thread will get unlocked and will start using this. So in our case, T2 is waiting for this mutex. So T2 will get unlocked. So let's before this uh, complete this execution, M was logged and then my amount became one and then M was unlocked. So as soon as you unlock it, whoever is waiting for this mutex will get the chance to execute this. So now T2 will get the chance and see as you have unlocked mutex T2 can lock it. So T2 will lock this mutex, T2 will also increment. Now T2 will increment whatever is updated value. So T2 will make it 2 and then T2 will also unlock it. So can you see that there is a mutual exclusion between these two thread that either you or I will use it, I mean use this critical section, I mean we will enter at this location one at a time. We both won't be working on this location at the same time. That's why we are using this lock and unlock. Okay. And this is how it works. And I'm not saying that T1 is written first, so T1 will get M dot lock first. No, either of these two can get lock, but the only guarantee is once T1 has locked mutex, this one, then T2 cannot lock it until unless T1 unlock that mutex. So can you see that you have a gate here? This is a gate. So it's like this. You have a race. Let's suppose T1 and T2 are two students and there is this race for one door to be opened and there is one table here and there is this key for this door. Okay. So either of these two students will reach to this table and get the key. So suppose T1 reaches this key, T1 will open this gate and get inside and do whatever it is willing to do. It will come back, lock the gate. Now T2 can take that key, go inside the door. But the situation is T1 and T2 both cannot go inside this door altogether. And this key is nothing but the mutex. And did you saw that? When T1 was inside this door, T2 was waiting here. T2 cannot answer, enter inside that. That's how this is also working. Let's suppose T1 happened to get this lock first, then T2 was waiting here itself. T2 cannot go inside this and execute plus plus my account. T2 is waiting and T1 got the lock so T1 can enter here. T1 actually incremented this and T1 did m dot unlock as soon as you unlocked it t2 get the lock because t2 was waiting for this mutex to be unlocked so t2 now can enter and increment this my account amount plus plus but t2 will work on the updated value which was changed by t1 so now there is no race condition here can you see that and this is your critical section or critical region so I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to hit the like button and if I miss something and you wanted me to include something then you please comment. I will be very happy to include that in coming videos or it will be helping to other fellows who are watching my videos and reading the comments. So till then I'll see you in the next videos. Bye bye. Hello friend this is Rupesh and you're watching CBB Nerds video series on C++ and today's topic is this mutex trilog. So actually this is a member function of this mutex class and there are so many trilog functions so if you want to see how many are there this is the list there are total nine trilog functions but uh, we are not going to discuss this one we are going to discuss this one today and if you see this we have this mutex variable and we will apply trilog on that before if you remember we were using this mutex and we were locking it so this is kind of a blocking call and this is kind of a non-blocking call. So if you are not able to lock the mutex, you will come back and return false here. 
okay that is the job of this trial arc it's that straightforward don't worry about that we'll go through one by one of all these points and complete all the points okay so trial arc tries to lock the mutex mind it it is trying to lock the mutex it is not actually locking the mutex because if you go and try to lock the mutex like this then in case this mutex is not free it means some another thread has already locked it then you will get blocked you will be waiting for this particular mutex but in case of this try lock you will try to lock this mutex and you will come back if it is not able to be locked okay so it returns immediately this is very important point it will return it won't get blocked and on successful lock acquisition returns true it means if this if statement is true it means this try lock was succeeded to lock this particular mutex if it returns false we actually didn't get the mutex this is what it is okay so second point is if try lock is not able to lock the mutex then it doesn't get the get blocked that's why it is called non blocking yeah that's what the second point is it is non blocking third one is if try lock is called again by the same thread which owns the mutex the behavior is undefined obviously so it is deadlock situation yeah that's what i have written here yeah it's undefined behavior and it's kind of a deadlock situation if you want to be able to lock the same mutex by the same thread yeah more than one time then go for the recursive mutex this is a uh, another type of mutex which is called recursive mutex if you want to be able to lock this particular mutex one more time then you can use this recursive mutex okay but we are not discussing about this recursive mutex we will see that in coming videos okay so all points are covered i have this particular example here which is going to increase the counter for what is this 1 2 3 1 lakh time okay so if i'm going to increase this particular variable in two thread t1 and t2 and having this same function it means we have this function acting like a thread two time so it is going to share this particular counter because it is a global variable so two thread will be trying to access this counter that's why we will apply mutex here to handle this critical situation i mean critical section not situation <laughs> so you understood right this is global so it will act as a common resource in both the threads this one and this one so let's run this program and try to see how this try lock will work so let's compile this i hope there is no error oh my goodness there is some error here i don't know okay this function is mismatching here i just forgot to change this place correct let's compile this again okay fine let's run this okay so the counter could increase up to this number and this is not a fixed number if i'll compile this again there is going to be some another number see and if i'll compile again sorry run again and run again 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 see it is giving you the different different numbers because first of all this threading and locking is totally dependent on the cpus so sometimes cpu will give you the lock sometime the cpu may delay to give you the lock and even if it is not locked i mean cpu may give you the permission to lock this pretty fast in some case and sometime it will give you little slower so it depends but why it is not 2 lakh it is some number like 76000 73000 79000 but why it is not 1 lakh so this is 1 lakh oh yeah then in that case it should be 2 lakh this counter should be incremented by 2 lakhs but it is not so let's see why it is not so let's suppose this is 41 and let's suppose there is this another thread 42 and they both are trying to access this counter so let's see what will happen here and this both threads are this function okay so let's suppose thread 1 is reaching to this counter first and it will try to lock that and it will get the mutex but is because it is not locked yet so counter will get the lock and simultaneously when t1 was actually incrementing this particular counter t2 also came and try to lock it but actually at that time t1 was busy in incrementing this particular counter and 
T1 actually didn't release that log, so T2 cannot get that log. So as I said, if this try log will not be able to get the log, it will return false. So in that case, T2 will not enter here. Okay, so this loop will again start for i is equal to 1. Okay, and maybe what will happen when it will come again for the second time. So this was first time. If it will come for the second time, maybe T1 was still busy in incrementing this. So T1 came first, first time here, it was busy. T2 came second time and still it was busy. But when T2 is coming for the third time, that time, actually what T1 was doing, T1 had released this lock here and T1 was maybe incrementing this particular variable and at that time maybe T2 asked to get the lock and obviously as it was unlocked then T2 got the lock then T2 will increment this so did you see this T2 incrementing this particular counter at this second time third time it is getting that mutex and going to successfully increment that but second time and first time it actually skipped that's why we are getting all those random values so we don't know what will happen but i am giving you the rough idea what might be happening so that you are getting those random values and we don't know what will lock first and what will happen but just because of this try lock we are not getting that 2 lakh okay this is what number we should get but as we are not waiting for T1 or T2 to complete and give me the log, we are actually skipping it. Okay, so if you, you are not getting that log, you will skip that particular iteration and you will increment this counter. And maybe it is possible that T1 was busy in incrementing this particular counter and you actually tried for 1 lakh time. This is quite possible. So I'm giving you the scenarios how to think. But really, if you want to get this 2000, sorry, 2 lakh number here, what you should do here is you just use lock. So let me just give you that program. So if I will lock it here, then we don't need this particular if condition. Okay, because this will definitely wait for that particular thing. Okay, so let me just remove this. Yeah. So now you won't go further until unless you have this lock. So both of the threads will actually wait for another thread to give the lock. So you are not skipping it. That's why this counter will always be 2 lakh. So let's compile this and run this. So it is 2 lakh. And then if you will again run this, no matter how many times you run this, it is going to be 2 lakh. Okay? Because we are waiting for another thread to release that lock i mean mutex and you are getting that lock for your thread but in case of that one let me just undo this in case of this one you was not waiting you just skip this iteration and iteration and iteration so it depends on the cpu speed if my cpu is very good it will iterate so fast that Maybe T1 or T2 was busy in incrementing this and another loop actually finished. Okay, so that's quite possible. So if I will run this, sorry, compile this again and run this. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it is possible that you may get this 2 lakh. Okay, so anything is possible in, in this thread world. So you see this, so many different different numbers are coming. Okay then, so we will sum this video, thanks for watching and next video is about, I don't know, maybe this thread, I mean trilog, it is really very interesting trilog, you know, it will take so many mutexes like this, let me show you that, m2, m3 and on and on and on and it will try to lock all those mutex all together and we will see this topic in next video so thanks for watching if you like the video don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this thanks for watching bye bye hello guys this is rupesh and i'm watching cpp nerds video series on multi-threading in c series and this video is about trilock in c11 threading
So this trialog is different than mutex trialog because just before this video, we learned about trialog which was in mutex class. So that trialog was the member function of mutex. So that trialog you was using like this m dot try lock excuse me for my writing okay so this m is a member of sorry object of mutex okay so you was using try lock like this but this try lock is totally different than this try lock let me just erase this so let's see what this try lock is this is nothing but a standard oh, sorry global function which takes number of mutexes and it will try to lock all of them let's read this out std try lock tries to lock all the lockable objects is exactly this does not take only mutex it takes shared lock and other lockable objects also but for sake of this video i will use only mutexes so that we can understand this easily so try lock tries to lock all the lockable objects passed in it one by one in given order so if you remember if we ever try to lock some mutex which is like this m dot try lock then you was locking sorry trying to lock only one object but in this case you can lock simultaneously so many objects at this line itself so let's suppose there is some critical section before this you want to lock let's say five mutexes this is mutex one this is two three four and five so you have to write m dot try lock try lock try lock and try lock so don't you see there is a very big code which is not needed so you can combine that into one line saying that try lock m1 comma m2 comma m3 and so and so forth and it will go till n because that n is not defined so you can take as many mutexes as you want and notice this this will try to lock it is very important to notice that it will try it won't lock it will try to lock try lock means if it is not able to lock it won't wait there it will come back and you will go ahead further if it is only lock means if you are not able to lock it you will wait but here it is try lock so you will not wait okay so the second point is on success this function returns minus 1 this is also very important otherwise it returns zero based mutex index number which it could not lock so here as i said i will be using mutexes it can be shared lock or deferred lock and other locks so what second point is saying if it happened to lock all the mutexes then in that case it will return minus 1 then you will get to know that okay all the mutexes were locked successfully if not it will return zero base index mutex number it means let's suppose m3 was not able to lock i mean this try lock could not lock m3 then it will return 2 because this is zero base index so this is 0 this is 1 and 2 then you will get to know that this second number means this m3 is failing in locking i mean you're you're not allowed to lock this m3 at this moment then you will take some respective action or you won't take any action you will do whatever is given to you without locking any of them okay we'll see all those parts don't worry about that so for now you just understand that if m3 was failed it will return 2 if everything was passed it will return minus 1 okay and we have to check the return value of this try lock in if condition and you will get to know that okay everything was passed or failed so this third point is if it fails to lock any of the mutex then it will release all the mutexes it locked before yes this is also a very important point let's suppose as i said this m3 was failed what about this m1 and m2 locked situation because it was able to lock m1 it was able to lock m2 then it happened to be like it was not able to lock this m3 but m1 and m2 was locked right so it will release m1 and m2 and then return 2 so this is also a very important point and fourth is if a call to try lock results in an exception unlock is called for any locked object before rethrowing so enough talk let's see the example for this so the example for this could be you have two threads this is t2 this is t1 and 
this thread is producing some data which is stored inside x and this is producing some data which is in stored inside y. So thread 1, thread 2 produced data are in x and y. There is another thread t3 and this thread is trying to consume whatever is produced here. So this will try to access x from here and y from here okay and after consuming it will set to zero means it will free all the things it was generated in t1 and t2 this example can be assumed like there is one bucket don't bother about the size the bucket name is x and this thread has bucket y and they both are getting filled okay and there is this thread t1 which has the bigger bucket which will try to pour whatever is there inside this and this into this and as you have poured this one and this one here you are actually empty correct so i have tried to simulate this kind of behavior in programming so let's see the program now and don't worry if you don't understand this program i will be giving this program in one of my blog yeah i have started giving my programs in blog so that you can copy paste and do some experiments on them because i have realized that so many people are asking my programs because it is really very really hard to type these things to actually do some experiment and i can understand that so i have decided i'll be writing a small blog and i'll copy paste this full code so that you can get that there and I'm going to start that thing from this video. So don't complain if you're not getting code for some other video. Okay. <laughs> so as I said, you will need three thread. So we have T1, T2 and T3. So T1 and T2 are producing something in X and Y and this consume will actually consume X and Y. So this is another thread. So let's look at the code here. This code is very simple. This is increment x and y. So I have only one function which will act as a t1 and t2 both. Because if you see here in main, I have created t1 and t2, but increment x, y function is similar. Okay. So two threads will be created on the same function and x and y I'm passing from outside as a reference and mutex is also passed as a reference. So this function will treat them and work accordingly. So let's compile this from beginning. I have created T1 and T2 and T3. So these threads will get created and I have joined here. So they will wait. I mean, your main will wait for them to be completed. Let's suppose T1 and T2 is started and T3 also is started. T3 will try to lock M1 and M2 together because it needs m1 and m2 logged in order to access this x or y variable okay and here this m will be treated as m1 for this thread 1 because we are passing m1 here and catching that m here and we are locking that and it will become m2 when it will come to this thread 2 okay i think you will be able to understand this so with this feeling i will go ahead and explain you this so as i said if this is returning this is the return value if it is minus one in this case it was actually successful to lock m1 and m2 so if it was successful then we will see that if x is not equal to zero and y is not equal to zero we will consume them inside x plus y variable see x plus y goes into this consumed this is our bucket bigger bucket this is smaller and smaller bucket you remember and after that we are emptying those buckets and i'm just simply printing this and yeah notice this i have to unlock them explicitly even though i didn't actually wrote any lock but you have to unlock because this try lock would have locked m1 and m2 then only you reached inside this if condition okay and if use count is equal to equal to zero means i have set some condition how many times i want to consume them so if i have successfully consumed them for five times i am happy okay and i am breaking this loop and i'll come back so we will return from here so let me just run this program okay we can just simply compile this compiled if i will run this okay see as i said i will be consuming till five and you can see that 
this is producing i mean incrementing plus plus means it is incrementing by one so first time x is equal to one y is equal to one and after doing that i am asking this thread to do something else means this is a very heavy duty thread it will do something here and dead doing something i have simulated for this thread as sleeping okay so it will sleep for one second means it is doing something for one second and as this one is sleeping this one will take x and y and fill its own bucket okay so this is how i have achieved this and this is why you are getting this answer x plus y becomes 2 after adding these two and then these two will go inside this then these two will go inside this and at the end after phi count you have total 10 because phi times x and phi times y become 10 so you can see that you have successfully filled your bucket so you can see that it was fairly simple program and don't worry i will be giving this program inside my blog so you can do some experiments on this okay so we'll sum this video here thanks for watching and don't forget to hit the like button because it motivates me to create other videos so i'll see you in the next videos and this is not my doggy okay bye bye hello friend this is rupesh and i'm watching cvp nuts video series on c threading series and this topic is about timed mutex in c threading so before this video we learned about mutex race condition critical section before this video i explained what is mutex and all the things related to that and we know if uh, there is some variable m dot lock then this is a mutex then you have to lock it and then m dot unlock this time music is also similar but it gives you the timing how long it will wait for this particular mutex what i mean to say is let's suppose there are two threads t1 and t2 okay and there is one mutex m1 dot lock you have this m dot lock here so either m1 will able to lock this first or t2 sorry t1 will able to lock this or t2 either of this will be able to lock m1 first and let's suppose t1 have locked then t2 have to wait for this mutex m correct so somewhere after some code you have to write m1 dot unlock then only t2 can acquire this lock till then t2 will wait here let's suppose there are few lines of the code so this was the typical behavior in mutex now can you see that if m1 is logged and let's suppose this time period is taken by t1 to actually unlock it okay and let's suppose this time is one minute then t2 will wait here for one minute and it is kind of a time waste if t2 have something else to do but you will say that then there is something called try lock in mutex correct so the syntax would be like instead of lock we will write here try lock then t2 will not wait for that lock and it will do something else correct i have given that video also you can see that after this video okay in the list that is called try lock on mutex but the problem with that try lock is it will immediately return false what i mean to say is t1 acquired the lock then t2 also tried to acquire the lock and we are using try lock then t2 will get false in that case and immediately start doing something else but i want to wait for this mutex for a particular amount of time let's say one second or 100 milliseconds and then i want to do something else not right at the moment then we have this timed mutex you will tell the timeout period that i want to wait for this much amount of time for this mutex and if i don't get that mutex in that particular time then i'm ready to do something else okay so this is what the definition says standard timed up mutex is blocked till timeout or the lock is acquired and returns true if success otherwise false so there are two things if this is timed mutex this one then in that case the another thread which is actually waiting for this mutex for this particular amount of time will actually get the mutex in given time let's suppose uh, 
if this mutex i mean this full work is taking one minute and this t2 is ready to wait for maybe 1.5 minutes or two minutes then in that case t2 will get the lock because it will wait for this t1 to finish okay because t1 took one minute and t2 is ready to wait for two minutes okay then in that case t2 will get the lock and t2 will also come here and do its job but let's suppose t1 was ready to wait for only half of the minute but t1 will take one minute to finish this then in that case t2 will not get the lock t2 will get false in return and t2 will understand that no i'm not going to get this mutex in given time what is half time okay so i'll tell you the syntaxes and all that so i have this full program here this was just the introduction and the glance what we will go through in this video okay so these are the member function what it supports there is this traditional mutex lock try lock these two function and this one is exactly similar in mutex and this but there are two different functions this one and this one so we'll be covering these two functions in this video so we'll take try lock for first okay so the definition for this says that waits until specified amount of time duration has elapsed or lock is acquired whichever comes first will happen okay and on successful lock acquisition it returns true otherwise it returns false okay so let's look at the program and we'll understand this better so this is your program here it is fairly simple program what we have in our hand is there is global amount variable which is initialized with this zero and we are creating two threads t1 and t2 and there is this function which will become thread okay and this one and two i am passing as thread one and thread two okay so these are the identities for the threads correct and as we are learning try lock for this is the syntax for try lock for it will take how many seconds we have to wait for so this is timed mutex m and we are going to try the lock for one second so let's see how this will work so t1 and t2 will get created at the same time and they both will try to lock this m because it is global so this is common between these two threads okay so they both will try to lock this mutex and any one of them will succeed okay so for this moment let's assume t1 succeeded first then it is saying that try lock for this much second which is one second but as it was in unlock position initially t1 will immediately get the lock instead of waiting for one second it will directly get the lock because it was unlocked already okay so my amount will get incremented by one which is zero so it will become one and i'm telling this thread to sleep for two seconds so what happened t1 acquired the lock mutex and it is sleeping for two seconds till now t2 was actually waiting it didn't do anything and then i'm printing this thread number one or two whatever has entered and then i will unlock it so that t2 can lock okay now as you know that t2 was also trying to lock this at the same time but t1 got the race then t2 said mm -hmm, okay i can wait for one second if you can give me this lock in one second but what happened actually this t1 took 2 seconds at least i'm not calculating how much how much time it took to increment this and to print this and to unlock it considering these two things very minimal i will say that t1 took 2 seconds and t1 was sorry t1 took 2 seconds and t2 was ready to wait for 1 second so as you can see that t1 actually took more time then t2 is ready to wait then what will happen for t2 it will return false here and t2 will not go inside this t2 will come here actually and t2 will print thread number 2 or something could not enter and lastly we are printing my amount so as t1 was entered here it will only increment by 1 so you will get only 1 
as an output. So let's quickly see the result and then analyze something else. There is no error and if I will execute this, see it is saying that thread 2 could not enter and thread 1 entered and the output is 1. So this is printing 1 and this is printing that thread 2 could not enter and did you notice thread 2 message was printed before this and that shows that thread 2 actually waited for 1 second only. Now let's increment this by 2 second and make this 1 second. Yes, now it will come. Okay, so let's recompile this and execute this. See thread 2 and thread 1 both entered and now you have 2 as an output inside this. Are you getting this? So this time what is happening? Let's suppose T1 got the log first, then T2 said, okay, I'm ready to wait for two seconds. And T1 came inside this, T1 actually did something for one second and T2, sorry, T1 unlocked it. And as soon as this got unlocked, T2 was actually ready to wait for two seconds, but it got the lock in one second only because T1 got it work done in one second. That's why you can see that T1 and T2 both was able to enter inside this. So that's why this timed mutex is so beautiful if you have time constraints in your program. I hope you would have understood this. So let's quickly move towards example number two, which is for try lock until. This is exactly similar to what we did before, but instead of only simple seconds, we will give the reference that you wait from now plus one second. So our std chrono steady clock will calculate what is current time. From current time, it is telling that wait plus one seconds. Okay, and it will do the same job. Okay, so let's compile this uh -huh. and execute this. See, it will tell you the same thing. Thread one was able to enter, but thread two could not because here we are waiting for one second. I mean, T two was waiting for one second and T one took two seconds. So actually timeout came and T two came here. Okay, now let's do the same thing. If you will make this one one and this one two, then both thread should be able to go inside this, correct? Let's see that. See, thread one and thread two, both was able to go inside this and result is two, okay? So this is how time mutex work. So thanks for watching guys. If you like the video, don't forget to hit the like button, dude. It will help me a lot to make more videos like this. And if you have any comment, let me know in the comment section. I'll be very happy to answer you for those things. Bye bye. I'll see you in the next videos. Hello friend. This is Rupesh and I'm watching CVBinner's video series on C++. And today's topic is recursive mutex in C++ threading. So this video comes under threading series and we'll see recursive mutex today. And this looks like a very big theory part, but it is not. It is really very easy. So let's go through the point one, but before that, I want to give you a little introduction about what is recursive matrix means in bit basic terms. So let's suppose you have some uh, recursive function. Let's make it uh, recursive. Okay. And this is the function and this is calling itself in recursion. There is this recursive function call inside this and it is possible that this recursion somewhere here is accessing some critical data, I mean critical section. So you will be using mutex to solve that critical section problem, right? So here you have m dot lock. First time when you call this, you will come here, you will go inside this and you will see that, okay, m is not locked. Okay, before that, let's have two threads, t2 and t1. These two threads were running this recursive function and there was this mutex lock and this thread t1 happened to lock this particular mutex first. So this mutex belong to t1 now. Then again it will call itself. See recursive will again call itself and then again it will come inside and t1 will see that m1 dot lock. It will try to lock this m again but as this is mutex it will 
say that I am already logged and it will wait for this. So this is kind of a deadlock situation because you have the lock. I mean, this thread have the lock, but again, this thread is looking for the same lock. So this situation should not come ever. So to get rid of this situation, we have this recursive mutex. So instead of writing std mutex, you will use a recursive mutex. Now everything will be same, but when this again call will happen, it will check and it will see that, okay, this M is a recursive mutex and I'm the only owner of this lock. So what it will do, it will allow to lock it again and it will go here and then it will again go here and it will come and it will see that okay it is recursive mutex so keep on going like this okay so there is no problem when this is recursive mutex and one more thing you have to write unlock so that unlock should be here m dot unlock now as you can see that it is always coming here and after this recursive function call it is going back so whatever is after this recursive function was never executed. So once the terminating condition will hit, it will go back and then it will start executing this m dot unlock. So let's suppose this m dot lock was logged for 10 times, then this m dot unlock will also be called 10 times. So we are good to go. And this is what the requirement is. The number of times you lock recursive mutex that many time you have to unlock it otherwise it will be considered still locked by this thread so this is the basic understanding don't worry i will show you two code one with recursion and another with loop yes exactly this scenario is applicable in loops also because it is possible that you have some for loop and inside that you have this critical section and you want to lock it again and again actually you don't want to lock it again and again but your situation is you cannot get rid of this mutex lock statement and whatever you want to access is inside loop so you have to lock it again and again so that is the problem with this scenario that your critical section this is let's suppose critical section then this critical section is inside loop right and if you are accessing this critical section by mutex first time, then again this loop will come back and you have to again lock it. And if it is normal mutex, you will end up having deadlock because you are going to lock it again. I mean, you are going to wait for this mutex by holding the lock of the same mutex. It is something like this. You have this mutex in your pocket and you're saying that if someone will give me this particular mutex, I'll go further. So that is not going to happen, right? Because you already have that particular mutex in your pocket and no one can give you the same mutex what is there in your pocket, correct? So this is a problem and the solution is this recursive mutex. So let's go line by line and try to understand what I have written as a notes here. So the first point is it is same as mutex, but same thread can lock one mutex multiple times using recursive mutex. That's what I explained here. If it is recursive mutex, you can go ahead and lock as number of time you want. Second point is if thread T1 first call lock or try lock on recursive mutex M1, then M1 is locked by T1 only. Now, as T1 is running in the recursion, T1 can call lock or try lock any number of time. There is no issue. That's what I said. If T1 have logged it first, then T1 can recursively lock it n number of time, no problem. So second point is, I mean third point is, but if T1 have acquired 10 times, either using lock or try lock method on mutex M1, then thread T1 will have to unlock it 10 times. That's what I explained here. If you are locking your recursive mutex 10 times in recursion, then you have to unlock it also in 10 times. You have to write your logic in such a way that you will end up unlocking it 10 times. Otherwise that mutex would be considered lock. So this is very important line. It means recursive mutex keeps count how many times it was locked so that many times it should be unlocked. Yes, this is very important point. 
how many times this lock was called this m is very intelligent this will keep the track how many time i was called if it is recursive mutex okay then only it can track that okay i was unlocked that many time okay so the last point is how many time we can lock recursive mutex is not defined yes exactly this recursion is i mean this level of the recursion is not defined so you can lock this maybe thousand times in some system and in some system it may be way more than that it depends on the system how much stack it have okay because this recursion works on stack right so how much space you have that many time you can actually go ahead and lock this correct and wait a minute this is very important point what was that how many time we can call the recursive mutex is not defined that's what i said but when that number reaches and if we were calling lock it will return std system error we have to catch it or if we were calling try lock it will return false so i have given try lock on mutex it is like you will try to lock the mutex if you cannot lock it you won't wait for that mutex so this is the logic behind try lock and lock is it will try to lock if it is not able to lock it will wait for that mutex to be unlocked by some another thread and then it will go ahead and lock it so in, in both the cases these are the respective outputs okay then enough theory let's look at the practical then we'll go for the bottom line actually these are the similar sort lines of these bigger lines okay so let's go for the practicals so this is your program here first we will see this program and then we'll go for the loop one okay so this is fairly simple program you can see that we have two threads one two we have this thread id 0 and 1 i'm passing this as thread id so that i can print this id and we'll get to know that okay what thread is inside this and i have this 10 and 10 and this 10 is saying that how many times this recursion will run okay because i'm checking this loop for is less than 0 then i will return okay so you should be knowing how recursion works to understand this little more okay so let's compile it logically so let's assume t1 was started first and it entered inside this and loop 4 is not less than 0 it is 10 for the first time m1 dot lock m1 is a recursive mutex yes this is the syntax to write the recursive mutex and t1 actually logged it once t1 logged it you know that t2 was also about to start this recursive function as a thread and the moment t1 logged it and reached here t2 was actually reached here and t2 also tried to lock this but t2 cannot lock this because t1 have already logged it so t2 will wait for this mutex to get unlocked okay so this t2 will wait here while t1 will actually keep on working so by t1 we will print this c which is 0 so 0 buffer plus plus this is some global variable which will be acting as a critical section in between these two threads and after incrementing this buffer we are calling ourselves recursion with the same c and this time loop for minus minus so this time 9 will go inside this and again we will come here and 9 is less than 0 yes it is false it will again come back it will try to log this mutex and it can actually lock because it is a recursive mutex and it will go ahead and keep on doing this until unless this loop becomes minus and if this is minus it will hit return so it will return it and then it will unlock it and then that stack will be empty and again it will return for 0 1 2 3 4 5 till like that it will return for almost 10 times and it will unlock this mutex for 10 time so let me show you this by running this and if you don't understand this i'm going to i'll explain you how actually it work okay so before that let's go ahead and run this so that i can show you that this is a working code so i compiled it it has compiled let's run this okay if you will see this our output is 0 for 0 0 for 1 so this first 0 is a thread id okay let me just write that recompile this and execute it see for thread id 0 it is printing 0 1 2 3 till 10 and then from 11 to 1 
is incremented by thread number one and thread number one was actually able to lock this because sorry thread number two was able to lock it okay there are so much confusion with this zero and one let me just make this one and two and recompile this so thread one did its job and as i said it have to unlock it how many time it is locking it so as looking at this number it is locking this mutex for 11 times from 0 to 10 so it has to unlock 11 times then only t2 can actually lock that so let's do one thing when it is going to unlock it let's give this message okay then we'll come to know that which thread is locking and which thread is unlocking it see it is very crisp and clear that initially it was locked by thread 1 and it was coming here till this location and it will again call itself so this thread id statement was printed 0 to 10 time after this this for loop would have become false and it went back so and back means it came here and then after that it will start executing this one so see it printed that unlocked by thread 1 and it printed this for 11 times 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 see it unlocked 11 times then only thread 2 locked it see then thread 2 also have to unlock it 11 times this is what it is okay so let's see how this actually work so let's suppose this t1 called first so there is this bucket for t1 and as i said it will come inside this it will check whether it is true or false so loop 4 will be initially 2 so 2 less than 0 is false so it will not return it will come inside this and m1.lock will be performed m1.lock is performed it will print lock by thread id so i will write in short order log by thread id and id is 1 so 1 and it will print this buffer okay so initially buffer is 0 so it will print 0 and after this it is hitting recursion so there is this again rec recursion function called okay so it will create another stack similar to this again we will check but this recursion is not called empty it is called with loop 4 and c so we can assume c is always 1 in this case and loop 4 is decremented by 1 so loop 4 was 2 this time it will go as 1 so we will have 1 less than 0 which is again false so it will not go inside this return it will again try to lock this and m dot lock was performed and then again it will print logged by thread id so logged by one and this time this buffer in was incremented by one so it will be one and then again it will hit this recursion so let's write this rec and this time this recursion c will be always one and this loop four will become zero now okay you remember this loop four came as one so one minus minus will become zero so we are passing zero inside another function and one function call will create one stack so this is first stack second stack third stack similarly zero less than zero no it is not true so mutex will be logged again d1 and this time this buffer will become two because we are always incrementing it okay so this has become two now and again we will have this rec this time it will be minus one because we got zero here okay inside this function call okay so zero minus minus will become minus one and then we will call function with minus one and this minus one less than zero is true okay see this condition will become true this minus one is less than zero yes then it will return from here and when this returns it goes back where it was called so after this what is left it was this one and this one 
so after this these two statement words left so now it will execute these two so m1 dot unlock so m1 dot unlock and then it will print unlocked by thread id so it will print unlocked what is this id one and once it is completed so this full stack forget about this boundary it is actually this much big okay so once it is done this full stack is over so how did we reach to this stack because of this call remember then again you will go back to this call only okay like this now you had executed this line so you reached and created this stack now you are back so whatever was left off at that moment you will execute that now so what was left m1 dot unlocked here and c out unlocked by and after executing these two this is again done and you will be going back here and similarly here also you went to this stack and two things was left so it will do the same thing again forget about this boundary it will do m dot unlock which is this one and it will print unlock by thread id one so can you see that how many times you logged it one time two time third time fourth time you went but this condition was false see this condition was false so you was returned you cannot go here you was returned and you came back and then you started executing m dot unlock one time unlock second time unlock third time so can you see that you logged one time two time second time and third time you unlocked one time second time and third time so you logged three times you unlocked three times and this is how recursion work and don't forget to hit the like button if you liked how i explain about the recursion here Oof, it was not easy <laughs> okay then so as you have unlocked it three times now you remember t2 was actually waiting here as i said t1 is this one t2 is also there somewhere which will have the similar things like this and here it will hit return like this it will again go back and then you will execute two line and then it will go back you will again execute two line it will go back you will again execute these two lines these two lines are nothing but these two lines this one and this one and why t2 was waiting here because mutex can be locked by any of the thread and we assume that thread one happened to lock this okay so this was about the recursion let's go for the loop example so this is your loop example this is fairly simple there is no recursion so i don't have to explain it much it is like you came inside this main and you have this recursive mutex m1 similarly how you saw this before and in one loop you are trying to lock it five times zero to five five times and you're unlocking it five times so you can do it in loop also it's just a demonstration i don't have to explain much here because it is very easy i just wanted to show you that this recursive mutex can be used in loops but remember that how many times you locked it you have to unlock it that number of time so i think i'm done here thanks for watching guys and don't forget to hit the like button dude it will help me a lot and motivate me to create more videos like this i'll see in the next videos bye bye hello guys this is rupesh and you're watching cpp nuts videos on c++ and today's topic is log guard in c++ threading and this is the syntax for that so you'll be having namespace and then log guard and yes this is a class i mean a template class so you have to give the type so you will pass the type and this is your variable name and this is the mutex. So you have to always pass the mutex when you create a log guard object. Okay, so this is object and this is mutex object. So before going for this notes, let's look at this program first. This program is creating two threads, this one and this one. And I am passing this thread number as t0 and t1. Okay. And this 10 is for this loop 4. And it will increment this particular buffer 10 times. So this thread will do this 
increment for 10 time and another thread will also do the same increment for the 10 time so ultimately this buffer will become 20 so we'll print this buffer in the end we'll see that okay it is getting 20 because initially it is 0 so these two threads are trying to modify this buffer at the same time that's why we will use this mutex lock and mutex unlock we know this very well how it work okay if you don't know how mutex lock and unlock work you go ahead and watch my previous videos on mutex but still let me quickly tell you that how it will work so t1 on t2 any of these can start this thread at any order so let's suppose t1 started this and t1 will able to lock this mutex first so t2 have to wait here until unless t1 unlocks this mutex so this is how it work now what if i tell you that you don't have to unlock it because you can see that when you are done i mean when you are done with this for loop and going out of this scope and you are about to terminate your thread before that only you are unlocking your mutex and the moment you started this thread you locked it so instead of this lock and unlock you can use this lock guard which will do this if you will write lock guard here let me show you that example now so this is the example with the mutex and if you will see this this is the example with non mutex with lock guard and as i said this is the syntax for creating lock guard and instead of writing mutex m1 dot lock and m1 dot unlock what this will do you will just create this and the moment you create it it will try to lock this m1 okay so it is a wrapper over this m1 so that's the first point it is very lightweight wrapper for owning a mutex on scoped basis what is this scoped basis we'll see that but the main point is it is a wrapper for owning the mutex okay so both thread 1 and thread 2 will try to lock this mutex m1 with this help of lock guard okay so you just understand that whenever you will create the object of the lock guard you have to pass the mutex and it will try to lock that mutex at that place only so that you don't have to write lock unlock and all that okay so assume that it is locked now as I said, let's suppose T1 locked it, then T2 will have to wait here, okay? Then T1 will go inside this for loop and will execute this buffer, I mean increment this buffer for 10 time and it will print that for 10 time and once it will come out of this for loop and the moment it is going out, I mean this thread T1 is completed in the destructor of this log guard it will unlock this mutex this is how it work so you create the the object and pass the mutex it will lock at that point only and whenever the scope of this particular object is over it will try to unlock it so this is kind of an automatic behavior so let's read the point now it is very lightweight wrapper for owning the mutex see there is owning this m1 okay so it will own the mutex on scope basis see as i said when it will go out of this scope i mean when this function call is over by this thread zero then in that case it will unlock it and the second point is it acquires mutex lock the moment you create the object of lock guard that's what i said when you create the object it will lock the mutex okay third point is it automatically removes the lock while goes out of scope exactly that's what we saw that and fourth is you cannot explicitly unlock the lock guard and this is very important point this point number four it says that i mean point number three it says that you cannot explicitly unlock the lock guard as you was doing in this example here you cannot do that because this is working on scope basis so it will unlock it automatically when the lock will go out of scope and it will go out of scope when this boundary will hit because this lock was created in this scope okay starting and ending curly braces so this is direct to this function now if you will say that let's suppose we have this task function task and this is starting curly braces and this is ending curly braces 
and there is this another start and early end curly braces here and if you will write lock guard here then what then yes when it will come out of this scope then it will call the destructor of this and the last point is you cannot copy lock guard exactly you cannot have i mean you cannot pass this ownership of the mutex you cannot move this so now you'll ask that when should i use this lock because there is something called unique lock if you have already gone through that unique lock people are confused like when should they use this one and this one so actually you can use this when you want to give a explicit message to the viewer of your code that after owning this mutex i don't want to release this mutex until unless the scope is finished so it will tell you the user that okay you wanted the full scope i mean you wanted this mutex alive till the full scope wherever it was created okay i mean wherever this object was created lock object and about this unique lock we will see in the next video so let's run this and sum this up so i have compiled it compiled successfully now i will run this see t0 started it and t1 will start with 11 because buffer was incremented till 10 by thread 0 you can see this okay and if you don't know how all these work you please go ahead and watch my previous videos on threading and watch it from the beginning so that you don't have any gap and don't be confused that t1 is written first so t0 is started first no even t1 can start first let me try to give you this example i will run this again and again and we'll see 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 this just before this see this time i was running so many time and this time see this t1 started first and then t2 started okay sorry t1 started first and t0 started after that i should change this order okay but you understood right so t1 is created later but t1 was created first and t0 was created later so i guess you would have enjoyed my video thanks for watching guys and don't forget to hit the like button if you like the video don't forget to hit the like button it would help me a lot i'll see you in the next videos bye bye hello friend this is rupesh and i'm watching cpp nuts video series on c plus plus threading and this video is about unique lock in C++ threading and this is the syntax for unique lock namespace std unique lock and it is wrapper over mutex so it will own the mutex so this m1 is mutex and this lock is nothing but an object of unique lock we'll see all these things so what is the purpose of this unique lock and before this we saw lock guard in previous video so if you don't know what is log guard, I would suggest please go ahead and watch that video before watching this one so that you can link it better. Okay. So first point is the class unique lock is a mutex ownership wrapper. Yes, it will own the mutex, whatever you will pass inside object. I mean, when you will create the object. Okay. And what I mean by ownership and all, I will, I will explain all those things later. So don't worry about that. Just understand that there is something or somewhere std mutex m1 then you can own this mutex by writing this std unique lock mutex and lock m1 and then you will handle this mutex m1 with this lock and this lock is nothing but a variable or a object and it allows these many things so can have different locking strategies so when you are writing like this you have different different strategy so this is one strategy you don't have to write anything when you are creating this object another strategy could be std let's assume i have written unique lock and then mutex and here some obj inside this you have to pass m1 and then comma and then you will pass the locking strategy and these are three locking strategy one is defer lock another one is try to lock and another one is adopt locking if let's suppose you're writing defer lock here like this then in that case when you're constructing this object this line it will not try to lock this mutex it will say that i'll just own this mutex but i'm not going to lock it or in other words 
it will wrap this mutex but it is not going to lock it okay the locking will happen in later point of time but not here but in this case because we have not given any defer lock here in example so it will try to lock this mutex at this particular line only okay i'll i'll show you all these things see this is the example and this is example number one i have two examples example number one is showing that i have not written any of the locking strategy then in that case it will automatically call the lock on the mutex m1 okay and this m1 is nothing but mutex here and another point is so we covered this one now another point is time constraint attempt at locking so you can actually attempt the locking using time constraint lock like try lock for and try lock until so i have given videos for these two you can go ahead and check out they are very simple it is nothing but you will do something like this m1 dot assuming this m1 is nothing but this mutex m1 dot try lock for here you will give time and let's suppose you have given two seconds there is a syntax to give the timing i'm just giving you the overview then in case if this mutex is not free then it will wait for two seconds the moment it asked for this lock from that time to two seconds it will wait okay otherwise if you just simply m1 dot lock if you just simply lock it try to lock it and if this mutex is not free this is going to wait for infinite amount of time if it is taking infinite amount of time but in this case you can tell the timing and here also it is similar but the syntax for time is little different for this until okay so these things are also possible with this unique lock so instead of m1 you will use if it is lock you will use lock and here also lock not here leave it we are not talking about this one we are talking about this one so this is also possible lock dot try lock for this much amount of time okay so time constraint locking is also possible with unique lock and third is recursive locking is also possible i have given the video for recursive locking if you don't know go ahead and watch that video transfer of the lock ownership yes you can actually move this particular lock somewhere else but you can only move you cannot copy because you cannot have two ownership of the same thing so suppose you have this mutex you cannot have two objects pointing to this same mutex okay obj2 obj1 so this is not possible okay so only move is possible you can move the ownership of this mutex from object 1 to object b then object 1 will no longer be the owner of this mutex okay so this is covered now condition variable this is a new topic i'll be covering in next video or the next video of that and this is very good video or the topic it is used for notification purpose one thread t1 is running and once it is done with some job it can actually notify to this t2 which is actually waiting okay so t1 is doing some job and t1 is waiting for some particular mutex and once it is done it will notify to this t2 or number of threads can be there so it can notify to all that i'm done and you you just come and try to get the mutex so there is a condition variable job i'll, I'll explain all these things in the coming videos so these things are possible with this unique lock and these are the locking strategies so defer lock is nothing but do not acquire ownership of the mutex at the same time i have given this example in example number two so don't worry we'll see that and second is try to lock so if you'll use this strategy it will try to acquire the ownership of the mutex without blocking so if you are not able to lock the mutex it will not wait for that mutex okay it will go ahead and this one is assume the calling thread is already has the ownership of the mutex it is like uh suppose you have already locked this mutex inside your thread let's suppose you have m1 dot lock okay so you have done this after this line you are creating your object like this and passing this m1 to that then this should not wait for this mutex because you have only locked it just after this i mean this particular line you just assume you have written this with comma here let's suppose you have lock and 
m1 comma this is strategy adopt lock so this makes sense right and assume that this full thing from here to here is written here okay so you have already logged it i mean you have already logged this mutex and you have come to this line means you own the mutex okay and then you want to create the wrapper of this mutex then it is possible you can just tell that i want to adopt the lock which is already locked so this is how you use that adopt lock now let's look at this examples and we will sum this up so as you can see that this is fairly simple program here and this is example number one forget about this example number two let me give some space here okay fine okay so we have two threads task will act as thread here and we will create two threads this t1 i'm passing as a thread number and t2 is going as thread number so t1 or t2 any one of them can hold the lock here so let's suppose t1 have locked it then t1 will come here and will increment this buffer for loop 4 so loop 4 is coming from here so this 10 is assigned here and we will increment this buffer for 10 times and after this notice this we are not unlocking it because this unlocking is happening in the destructor of this unique lock okay so this destructor will be called because we have created this object in stack so destructor will automatically be called when the scope of this lock object will go off then in that case in that destructor it will unlock this mutex then once it is unlocked this thread 2 will try to lock it and we'll get the lock and we'll increment this buffer from 10 to 20 and let's see that execute this see t1 incremented this from 1 to 10 and then t2 started from 11 to 20 so any one of them can start first so it is not like t1 only will start this first and t2 will start second no t2 can start first and t1 can start later so you can notice that if you have not unlocked it t2 would have never got this lock and only t1 would have executed this and done what i'm saying is let's suppose if you are just simply using mutex just that's it just compile this and execute it see it is executed till t1 and t2 is still waiting see we are waiting and i'm sure we will wait till infinite and we will not get the lock i mean t2 will not get the lock because t1 only logged it forgot to unlock it so let's try to unlock that again t1 dot unlock so this is fine code let's kill this recompile it execute it see it is done okay so you have to unlock it but in our case we are not unlocking it it is doing the job automatically because this unlock is happening in the destructor of this one correct now let's move to the next example see we are using the locking strategy now and locking strategy is defer lock so does not call the lock on the mutex m because used defer lock correct so this comment says exactly what i said you before and as you have not logged this mutex here at this line you have to lock it later so why we do this actually what happens we are just saying that i am owning this but i am not locking it so you can have n number of code here and then you can lock it so this is the flexibility which is not available in log guard because log guard will immediately try to lock this as i have given the comment here it is not needed as it will be unlocked in the destructor of the unique lock so this is fairly simple code let me just simply execute this one compile successfully executed this one so this is also compiled and giving you the same output correct so i think i'm done here thanks for watching guys don't forget to hit the like button guys if you like the video it will help me a lot and i'll see you in the next videos bye bye hello friends this is rupesh and i'm watching cvp nerds video series on c threading series and this video is about condition variable and this is very important topic if you want to synchronize your threads on some conditions this is the answer for you so the important point for condition variable is condition variable are used for two purpose one is notify other threads uh, there is thread one it is running and there is thread two this is also running at some point this went for sleeping on some condition variable I'll explain everything just hold for some time I just want to give you a bigger picture of the problem then we can go 
much more deeper. So assume that this thread was sleeping and this thread was working. Now after doing some job, now this thread wants to tell to this thread that please wake up. So this is called notify and there are two ways you can notify notify one and notify all. So notify one means okay let's suppose there are so many threads. So if you are using notify one and this thread is notifying and let's suppose t2, t3, t4 till tn were waiting for some condition variable and you are notifying one using t1. I'll repeat this again, t1 was running, t2, t3, t4 were sleeping on some condition variable. Now t1 can notify either of this or all of them. So if it is notify 1, I mean if t1 is notifying using 1, then either of this will get notified. If it is using notify all, all will get notified. So this is about notifying and second is wait for some conditions. So as I said, t2, t3, t4 and tn were waiting for some condition variable. So let's suppose there is some condition variable c and assume that using this condition variable only t1 is running. So it is running and on this condition variable all of these are waiting. And obviously to synchronize these you have to have this common condition variable. Okay, so for some reason all these threads were waiting for this condition variable and this thread was running and it uses this condition variable to notify either of these or all of them. Okay, so these are two purpose of condition variable. You will notify and you can wait. Now that being said, let's directly jump to the program. We'll see all these come in little later. So this is the program. This is very simple program we have this balance let's suppose this is some kind of account and we have this balance okay is equal to zero and now there are two threads t1 and t2 one thread is trying to withdraw the money and another thread is trying to add the money okay and currently the balance is zero now what do you think which thread should start first and which should start second i mean logically add money should start first because if you don't have any money, you cannot withdraw it, correct? And let's suppose this start, I mean this withdraw money thread is starting first. So it will come here and it will try to acquire the lock, this mutex with this unique lock. So what it means is it is just kind of a wrapper for this mutex and owning the mutex. So this line means you are locking this mutex M here. You have successfully locked it. Now you will come here. This is condition variable dot wait. And you have to pass this unique lock object here. And there is this predicate or the condition you will check in order to go further or to wait. So that condition is, so balance is not equal to zero. Is it true? No, currently balance is zero. So it will return false. So if this predicate is returning false, then this thread will wait by releasing this mutex. So what will happen is, let's suppose this is withdraw thread. First it locked M, which is this mutex. And then it is saying that I'm waiting for this condition to be true by releasing this mutex. So this unlocking is internal inside this statement. So it will unlock and wait for this condition variable. So waiting by releasing m so this is first and this is second and as this is started first it will acquire the lock first and it would have done all these things but parallelly this thread was also started and this is using lock guard you can use this unique lock here not a problem but but i didn't find any use of this unique lock here so i just went for lock now the point is this will also try to lock this mutex but as i said this will lock the mutex and do all these things so it would have gone in the waiting state for this particular mutex and as this thread 2 release this mutex this will acquire the mutex will add this money which is 500 inside the balance and it will say that okay amount added and current balance is 500 and after adding the balance see this is very important point it is saying that whoever is waiting for this condition variable I want to notify them 
and I'm using notify1 because only one thread is waiting. Notify1 will get executed and, and this thread will awake. So after awaking, this is the process. It will try to log the mutex. If it is succeeded, it will check this condition. If this is true. So yeah, this is true because we have changed the balance. So balance is not zero now. It is going to return true. And if it is returning true, it will go further. Okay. Then it will go for if balance is greater than equal to money and all that stuff. So first step is it will try to lock the mutex. Second is it will check the condition. And what if it is awake? I mean, you notified it without changing the balance. It will again check. Okay. Yeah. Balance is not equal to zero. It will again start waiting on this condition variable. Okay. So it is not going to go further until unless this balance is not zero. So this is very simple. I'll quickly recap it. I assumed this withdraw money thread will start first. So it will go here and it will acquire the lock. It will go here. We have condition variable dot wait and we have to pass this UL, which is this unique lock so that it can unlock this mutex while it is waiting for this condition variable. Okay. And we have this predicate and we'll check whether we should go further because we have this condition to go further. Okay. That's why we are using this condition variable. There is no point in deducting the money if you have zero in your account, correct? So it will wait because currently you have zero in your balance. So it locked the mutex first step, second weighted by releasing the mutex M. So this weight will release the mutex, which is acquired by this UL here. Okay. And as soon as you release the mutex, this one was waiting for this mutex. So it will get the mutex and it will add the money what it got from here. Okay. And it will notify this thread now, which is waiting on this condition variable. So see this CV and CV has to be similar. So as this one will notify it, this thread will try to acquire the lock. Okay. It will get the lock and then it will again check whether I should wait because maybe the balance is still zero. So, it will check whether this condition is true and this time it happened to be true, then it will go and do the job. So that was the first case. Let's suppose this one started first, then it will acquire the lock. It will add the balance. And by that time, this withdraw money is waiting for this lock because this mutex is already locked here. Okay. So this thread is already waiting here only. Okay. This is waiting here only. And this has executed and done everything. Now we don't need this condition variable notify one because we have not waited on this condition variable. We could not reach to this place. What is happening in this case? This is very simple. Once you have done this, you are notifying one, but this call is totally waste because no one is waiting for this condition variable right now because this thread could not go further after this. Okay. It is waiting at this line only. Okay. But it will work correct because after completing this, this function or this thread will go off. Then in that case, this log guard will call the destructor and there this mutex will be released. So once this mutex is released and this was waiting for this mutex, then it will start and it will check whether condition variable is satisfying or not. So this balance was updated. You don't have to wait here. It will return true and then you will do the job. So let's see, I mean, the, let's run and see the behavior of this. And then we'll come conclude it. I'll compile this compile successfully. If I'll execute it, see it is saying that amount added and current balance is 500. And this statement is coming from thread number one, sorry, thread number two. So this started first. Let me give some weight here. So as you can see, I have written this waiting statement here. So what this will do, it will call this thread and this main thread will sleep. So what I'm telling you is you can start this thread first. I don't bother because I have this condition variable and it will obviously wait for this condition variable just to prove that I am writing this sleep here. Okay. So let's compile this again and execute this. See, it is waiting for two seconds. And then also it did the same thing. This thread added the money first, even though this one was started first. So this is actually going and waiting because this balance is zero. Okay. In this case. So let me just remove this. This is perfect. Now, what if you want to deduct more than 500? Let's suppose 
you want to withdraw 600 but you have only 500 in your account then if you compile it and execute it it is saying that amount added current balance is 500 so again this will add the amount first and it will notify to this one and it is saying that amount can't be deducted current balance is less than 600 and it is saying that current balance is 500 now so it didn't actually deduct the amount but that is not the point the point is whatever you do your add money will always start first so this is also very good way to utilize this condition variable if you want to start some thread first but you are writing both the threads or all the threads at the same place so it can start I mean your OS can start any of the thread at any time but you want some thread to start first then you can use these condition variables to actually run some thread before other threads so let's quickly go through these comments condition variables allow running threads to wait on some conditions and once those conditions are met the waiting thread is notified using notify one or notify all and that's what you did here correct you notified then second point is you need mutex to use the condition variable obviously it will use this particular mutex to actually wait on okay and the mutex release is automatic inside this don't forget that third point is if some thread wants to wait on some condition variable then it has to do these things so these are the step a b c if you want to wait on some condition variable you have to do all these one is acquire the mutex log using std unique or whatever object you want to write but you have to acquire the log second is execute the wait wait for or wait until there are three flavors for this you can go and check that there are no much difference for these things they are just for time constrained okay our main focus is on this one wait so we'll say that we'll execute wait and the wait operation automatically releases the mutex and suspend the execution of the thread if that condition is not true and the third is when the condition variable is notified the thread is awakened and the mutex is automatically reacquired and the next thing is the thread should then check the condition and resume waiting if the wake up was spurious and what i mean is after locking you can again check whether this condition is meeting or not if it is not meeting you will again go for sleeping because this notification can be spurious and uh, what i mean by spurious is uh, for now you just understand that the false wake okay someone did this by mistake you just understand like this someone notified you by mistake even if this condition is not met i mean this balance is still zero but someone notified you so you will again wake up and check whether this balance is zero if it is zero you will again sleep now the take home is condition variables are used to synchronize two or more threads yes you can synchronize threads using condition variable by saying okay now you do the job now i'll do the job okay things like that okay you can notify from one thread to another thread which is actually sleeping on some condition and the best use case of condition variable is producer consumer problem and this i will explain in next video so go ahead and watch that video and thanks for watching i'll see you in the next videos bye bye don't forget to hit the like button it will help me a lot see you bye bye hello friends this is rupesh and i'm watching cpp nerds video series on c plus plus mcq questions and this mcq question is about a threading mcq question and this is number two and i didn't had much time so i'm giving this mcq video today and these days i am explaining threading so this video is about threading i mean this mcq is about threading i'll check your knowledge on threading and i may surprise you if you are not much into the threading and all okay so let's see if you can answer for this question so pause the video and try to understand what is happening here and if you happen to find that problems solution let me know in the comment section so wait for some time you'll get the answer so one two three four five i think you would have come up with the answers so let's check out whether there is some problem in this code or not so first let's compile this so if i just simply compile this it has compiled successfully so compilation error is not there if i'll execute it there is no problem in this code but wait a minute don't go anywhere there is a problem in this code and i'm going to explain that to you can you see the locking order is reversed first thread 
okay let's start from the beginning so we have thread 1 and thread 2 thread 1 thread 2 functions are different so these two will start parallelly and thread 1 will try to log mutex m1 and thread 2 will try to log mutex 2 and then thread 2 will try to log mutex 1 and thread 1 will try to log mutex 2 can you see this and recall there was some problem called deadlock yes this is a deadlock situation here i'll explain you what deadlock is and why this is a deadlock situation let's assume this t1 and t2 started so this is thread axis this is thread and this is time the possibility is as we are starting these two threads at the same time the possibility is not at one second let's suppose a uh, unit is microseconds this one is one microsecond two microsecond and three microseconds so at one microsecond these two threads were able to lock mutex m1 and this one was able to lock mutex2 so here you have m2 locked and here you have m1 locked now at this stage there is no issue because m1 was not locked yet and here m2 was not locked okay so and let's suppose at second microseconds both are trying to lock i mean this one t1 is trying to lock m2 and this one is trying to lock m1 so m2 was locked already by thread 2 and m1 was locked by thread 1 and you know this if you want to lock and if it is already locked you will wait so this thread will wait and similarly this thread 2 will also wait because m1 is locked before so this is one of the example of deadlock deadlock means let's suppose there are two resources deadlock cannot come in single resource and there are two processes so this process want to have this while this process is holding this resource okay so this is a resource and this is process this p1 want this resource while it is holding this resource so it's like two boys asking that you give me your chocolate and then only i will give my chocolate and another boy is also telling the same thing if you will give my chocolate sorry if you will give your chocolate i will give my chocolate correct then there is a deadlock no one is gonna give chocolate to each other and the same situation is coming here and if i will run this you may not see the problem here because our processor is very much fast that this particular condition may arise in thousand times or it may arrive at first attempt also but there is a situation i mean there is a possibility that it may not come in even one million times okay but this can come and if your system whatever system you have designed is not deadlock proof then this is not a good system and if i want to show you the deadlock what i have to do is i have to put a weight in between this one and this one so you can see that it was not failing it was perfectly fine code if i'll run this see i'm running it so many time but still it is not blocking okay there is no deadlock it is exit successfully okay but if I, you want to see the deadlock let me include this like this okay if i'll compile this compile successfully see if i executed it see my cursor is actually waiting here let me just kill this and clear the console and re-execute it see it is waiting i mean system is inside deadlock it is not going to come outside so let's see what is happening here thread 1 thread 2 started parallelly thread 1 logged mutex m1 and went for sleep thread 2 logged mutex and went for sleep then both wake up and asking for each other's mutex okay and this is not going to happen before i was not applying this then in that case it was not coming as a deadlock but it is a deadlock because 
our computer is so fast that whenever it was acquiring the lock of this mutex m1 at the same time it was able to lock this m2 and thread 2 was not even started by that time or vice versa if thread 2 started first then thread 2 was able to lock mutex and after that it was able to lock mutex m1 and thread 1 was not started by that time as this thread 2 have locked both and let's suppose thread 1 is actually reaching here once this thread 2 have both the locks successfully then thread 1 will wait here there is no problem and once this unlock will happen it will get the lock and will do the job but the situation is when thread 1 reaches to m1 and when thread 2 reaches to m2 and locked and then just after that thread 2 is also looking for this i mean executing the second statement and thread 1 is also executing the second statement then in that case it will be the problem otherwise it is not the problem okay so the solution to this problem is you should not change the order of your mutex lock there won't be any issue if you have this like this there is no possibility of deadlock here because either of this thread will happen to log mutex m1 and if thread 2 logged mutex m1 thread 1 cannot and if thread 1 cannot it will wait here and by that time thread 2 will lock mutex m2 and will do the job and lock these two and then it will wake up and do the job so there is no situation that it can have a deadlock here let me just place that again I mean that weight and it, we can see that see I'll put the weight here again and I'll put the weight here and we can compile this see it is still in the deadlock situation see so that is what the deadlock is my goodness change this one and change this one recompile execute this see no issue even if you are sleeping there is no problem so thanks for watching and if you like the video don't forget to hit the like button guys and make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you can get the notification for upcoming videos like this i'll see you in the next videos bye bye hello friends this is rupesh and watching cmp Nut video series on c plus plus threading portions and today's topic is thread or process synchronization but we will only use the thread example to explain this topic why because whatever condition apply for synchronization on thread the same thing applies for the process okay so whatever mechanism and whatever things we'll discuss both i mean that is common for both of the things okay so we'll take the thread example and that applies to the process okay let's drive into the topic now so the first part is thread or process synchronization synchronized to access critical section so it is very simple that we are going to understand the synchronization word in between threads okay so let's take an example of thread t1 and t2 and if they want to synchronize then there has to be a critical section here and what is this critical section critical section is one or collection of program statements which should be executed by only one thread or process at a time so it is very clear that critical section is one or collection of program statements so there can be only one statement and there can be a two three four or n number of statements and they all can be treated as critical section and synchronization problem comes when there are multi-threading and multi-processing systems what i mean is if there is only one thread either t1 or t2 it doesn't matter and that thread is executing some critical section there is no point in synchronization because no other thread can access that critical section at the same time what i mean by same time is and yeah for that uh, let's use this example here so when we are creating two thread t1 and t2 we have written these two lines so it is quite possible that these two threads will start at the same time so let's make a graph here so this is thread versus time graph and this time unit i'm not writing because it depends on the processor how much speed it can handle so we will just go with the numbers like time one time two time three we'll not talk about the unit of the time whether it is microsecond or something 
as I said, we will create T1 and T2. So at time zero, it got created. Both T1 and T2 reach here at time one. Okay, so we'll say that at time one, they are at this location because they both started at the same time and it is possible that it will reach I mean both the both the threads will reach here at the same time and this particular statement is going to change whatever value you are passing like for thread one it will add 100 inside this bank balance and don't forget that this is a global function so it is common in both the threads so t1 and t2 both will try to access the same bank balance variable okay so if t1 is changing this bank balance variable then t2 can see the reflection okay so it is actually common between these two threads because it is global it is not local to this thread correct so at this particular time what happened that it is going to change this bank balance with the values they have in this value okay so for time t2 sorry thread t2 bank balance is equal to bank balance plus val which is nothing but 100 sorry 200 okay for t2 it is 200 and for t1 this bank balance is equal to bank balance plus 100 and these two instructions are going to be executed at the same time so currently this being balance is zero here and the zero here because we uh, have reached at this instruction at the same time okay time one so bank balance was initially zero so it is zero for both the instructions or both the threads now the result of this and this would be bank balance 200 and here bank balance is 100 now the confusion is once you are out of this scope what is the value of this bank balance 200 or 100 if we execute these instruction in both the threads at the same time then we will have this confusion and this is the problem called race condition also like you have a race to change this data and once the race is completed we don't know which will win this thread will win or this thread will win who will update their data and there is no certainty that what would be the data value if you want to understand this topic little more detail i can tell you that if you write something like uh, bank balance is equal to bank balance plus some value maybe 100 if this is what you are going to execute in your program like this then how processor will do this so let's break this full thing into two parts first is you should be knowing key what is the value of this bb i mean bank balance first it will load whatever is there inside b i mean bb into this register so initially bb was holding zero and it is loaded into some register now it will check that okay there is an add operation and we have to add 100 to that then the register value will get updated now this register is holding 100 value because before it was 0 now plus 100 means 100 and then you have to store this 100 back to this BB it may look like this so this is 100 and this is some address 0 close 11 and this is nothing but your bank balance okay so this is address part this is value part so it got updated so as you can see that when we are storing this instruction I mean this registers value back to this value portion of this bank balance either of these two can win the race and actually update this particular position so either 200 will come here or 100 will come here this is what i wanted to explain you with this load and store example i just went little deeper inside this statement but let me tell you one thing it is not common what i mean to say is if i will run this program it is really very hard to see the result that it is 200 or 100 we will most likely see the result as 300 why because it is 
very uncommon to reach to this place at the same time okay and nowadays processes are really very fast that this time unit have become very small that it is really very hard to actually get this situation but let me tell you one thing that it is quite possible in maybe 1 million or trillion times you may end up into this situation and if this is really a bank balance and if your system is really like this you may end up corrupting your system and this is not good for some company now whatever we discussed so far is a problem now we will go for the solution and i know you know the solution solution is locking mechanisms and we will use mutex for that what happens is what i mean by this is let's suppose you have this condition like if value is less than or equal to 0 you just return okay before reaching to this statement actually you have this condition also and then after this you have this bank balance plus is equal to val okay and you have this thing inside your function what is the critical section here what you should guard with the mutex actually the critical section is this portion only this is not the critical section because you are not going to corrupt any data by doing it in parallel you are just checking this value right and let me tell you that how to actually identify the critical section when there is some common object or variable between one or i mean more than two threads then that becomes the critical section here bank balance is common between these two threads so this will become the critical section this value 100 and 200 is actually local to these two threads t1 and t2 but this bank balance is actually common and wait a minute i said ki if it is common then it is a critical section but wait a minute it's not a critical section if you are just reading the value of that variable what i mean is if you just did this see out bank balance then this is not the critical section even if it is i mean this bb is common for both the threads because we are not changing anything critical section comes when there is a right operation on your common variable if there is a read operation on your common variable it is not considered as critical section because by reading that you are not going to corrupt that but if you will write it there is a possibility that you may corrupt because you will execute the update instruction at the same time i mean both the instruction i mean both the threads will execute this instruction at the same time so as we have discussed so much about the synchronization and yeah this is the problem let's look at the solution now so the solution to this is using a mutex std mutex is a class um so there is a mutex and yeah that mutex should be common between the threads then only you can lock that and have a synchronization using the mutex so m dot lock and m dot unlock and you are done you have synchronized your bank balance access across the threads and you are safe now if we will draw the similar diagram again okay diagram is ready now as i said these two threads will reach to this particular instruction at the same time but now we have this instruction before that then let's assume these two threads have reached here at the same time this is instruction one i mean statement one two and three and let's suppose at statement one both the threads have reached at the same time at time number one and this mutex log will grant either of this thread that you can access this mutex and go further so let's suppose randomly it gave the chance to thread number two then thread number two will only go ahead and thread number one will start waiting as t2 have got the lock and i should tell you that you should be knowing what is mutex before this so if you don't know what is mutex please go ahead and watch my mutex video for this so now t2 will reach to this bank balance plus is equal to value so here b b is equal to b b plus as this is t2 t2 is doing 200 and the result is 
200 okay now bb is 200 right now after this update m dot unlock was executed then that mutex on what this t1 was waiting is released now t1 will be able to lock it and move further because t1 was actually waiting here itself then t1 can go ahead now when this t1 is doing bb is equal to bb plus 100 it is actually nothing but 300 because bb is now 200 here and 200 plus 100 is 300 as you can see that only one thread will execute this particular critical section at a time okay if there were t3 t4 and n number of threads either of these threads will actually get the lock and that thread is only allowed to go inside this and execute this and then after executing this that thread has to unlock it otherwise it is a deadlock situation whatever you are locking you have to unlock when you are done and this is what is called synchronization. You are synchronizing these threads using mutex. So I think I'm done. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button guys. It will help me a lot and it encourages me to create more videos like this. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. And I'll see you in the next videos. Hello, hello, hello. This is Rupesh and you're watching CPP Nerds video series on C++ threading topics. And this one is an standard or std lock function this is very important function don't take it easy because it is really very important i'm telling you and watch this video till end so that you can understand the topic very well so let's start this so the std lock in c++ threading used to lock mutexes but it is very special kind of function which actually allows you to lock multiple mutexes okay it is used to lock multiple mutexes at the same time Okay, wait a minute. Now, another thing which is very important about this is it tries to lock all the mutexes in deadlock free manner. I mean, if there is the situation like this kind of situation would not come if you will use lock and if you want to lock mutexes and you are using this function. Didn't understood much? No problem. We'll, we'll see all these things. We have so many examples here. Okay. So let's first go for the important points. The syntax looks like this and this std lock is a function m1 m2 m3 m4 there can be n number of mutexes or lockable objects and one more important thing the lock sequence like if you have given m1 m2 m3 m4 then the locking sequence would not be guaranteed that it would be m1 first then second then third then fourth no actually all arguments are logged via a sequence of call to lock which is a mutex lock okay and try lock which is on mutex so what are these functions are it is like m1 dot lock and this function is this one std lock so let's suppose your thread starting here and ending here it needs so many mutexes to be logged to perform some job okay and then it will release all those mutexes and it will be done but it needs so many mutexes because maybe it is trying to access three four critical data or critical sections to produce something so in that case you should always go for std lock and that's very good thing about it so the first point is this one it can try internally lock try lock or unlock on all these different mutexes and it will check whether all can be locked maybe sequence can be m1 first m2 m3 and maybe m4 is not lockable in that case it will actually wind up everything means it will release the lock of m3 m2 m1 and next order could be m4 then m1 m2 and m3 because m1 actually failed to get locked it means m sorry m4 failed to get locked it means m4 was already locked by some another thread so when it will retry it should not retry with m1 m2 and m3 i mean it can but the best way would be to try m4 first so i'm just telling you that m4 can be tried first so it may change the sequence of locking in another iteration so what i mean to say is see this lock internals we don't know but we can guess so what i'm guessing is 
let's suppose initially it is going with this order m1 m2 m3 m4 and let's suppose m4 is not lockable in that case we cannot wait for this m4 by holding m3 m2 and m1 in our hand no we have to release them and then wait for m4 otherwise it will be a deadlock situation you will hold for i mean you will hold something and you will ask for something and it may be forming a cycle okay so next order first order could be 1 2 3 4 next order can be 4 1 2 3 so actually it could not lock fourth one so it will first unlock this one this one and this one and then it will rearrange the mutex's order to be locked in another iteration so this is zero iteration this is first iteration and then it will wait for this one and by this time suppose this got freed it will hold the lock and it will try for this one and let's suppose this time it was not able to lock this one because when it was waiting for this one this one was locked by some another thread maybe some thread t3 then as i said it cannot hold this lock and this lock and wait for this so it may rearrange like two four one three and then it will wait for this one and obviously it have released the lock of these two so if some another thread is actually waiting for this they can actually do their job and this is just my thinking i'm not sure what they internally do and how they actually do this this is just my thought so we were talking about this order sorry point number two order of locking is not defined exactly because as you can see that it has to try to get all the locks so that we can move forward but if it is not able to lock any of them it will rearrange and maybe it will try for that lock first and it will release all the held locks so that it can avoid the deadlock so this might be the thing what it should be doing but internally it applies lock try lock or unlock to actually do all these iterations correct okay so as order of locking is not defined it will try to lock provided mutexes m1 m2 m3 m4 in any order and ensure that there is no deadlock yes this is what it does that's what i have explained it will try very hard to not get into the deadlock situation okay and what algorithm it uses nobody knows that and it is not mentioned anywhere and yeah it is a blocking call means it will block itself i mean if you have logged i mean if you have called std lock m1 m2 m3 m4 and as i said if m4 is not lockable it will release all these locks and wait for m4 so actually it will wait so this is kind of a blocking call it is a waiting call with this much of understanding let's go for this example so this is example number zero this is example number one this is two and maybe i have three but it's okay we'll discuss these three first then we'll go for third one okay so in first case there is no deadlock i have given the comment here there is no deadlock okay why we'll see that let's suppose this thread one is running and we applied this lock m1 comma m2 and thread 2 is running and m1 comma m2 and now let's try to understand what is happening here and these two threads are running parallelly and assume that from main function you call them parallelly i mean you created them parallelly then actually both the functions will try to be executed first i mean whatever thread will start for this fu this function will be executed and can you see that if this thread started first and maybe this first reached to this lock and it will try to lock m1 and let's suppose it got the lock and by the time m1 was locked by thread 1 after that thread 2 tried to lock m1 and it could not lock it because it is already locked then it will not go further it will wait here only for m1 okay thread 2 will wait and as m1 is already locked with thread 1 it will go for m2 m2 will also be locked and it will do its job and then remember one thing you have to unlock these two this is not a wrapper this is a function and you are using mutexes then either you have to unlock these mutexes or you pass inside this function i mean this m1 m2 m3 can be an object of lock guard or unique lock then there is no need to unlock these mutex because those wrappers over the mutex will take care of that but in case of raw 
mutex when there is no wrapper on it you have to unlock after this lock that example i will show you don't worry about that so as you can see this is never going to be into the deadlock situation and yes i have given a deadlock video there i have explained this with so much of good diagrams and all if you don't understand why it will not be deadlock and the short answer is if you don't want deadlock then always lock in similar order so if you're locking m1 first in one thread then m2 sorry m1 should be locked first in another thread also and the order should be similar let's suppose in thread number one you are locking in m1 m2 m3 then three thread two should also lock m1 m2 and m3 order it should not change the order okay otherwise it may fall into this dead lock situation okay so that was the first example sorry zero example first example is this is also not a deadlock yeah this is very important I'll, I'll i'll tell you actually this is a key to understand this video or the topic let's suppose there is the same scenario these two threads started parallelly and any of these thread can actually lock m1 and by the time it is locking m1 this is actually locking m2 there could be a situation like that what i'm telling you is let's suppose at one second or two second let's suppose at one second t1 and t2 actually reached to this line and actually they are trying to lock here m1 will be locked first and then m2 will be locked right so in thread one m1 is being locked and in thread two m2 is being locked is there any problem in this no m2 is different and m1 is different though so they both will be able to lock them successfully and let's suppose m2 2 is going to be locked by thread 1 then what will happen now see thread 1 is actually going to lock m by another second or something and don't go for the unit so i will just take the example of second so in seconds second m2 is going to be locked but m2 is already locked then thread 1 have realized that actually m2 cannot be locked so what it will do it will release this m1 and as i said it will change the order so now before it tried m1 and then m2 maybe this time it will try 2 first and then m1 okay so m2 will be tried second time sorry first time and as m2 was not able to be logged m1 was released and m2 was tried first and we were waiting here for m2 by that time as you know m2 was locked by thread number 2 so what is remaining here m1 so this thread will actually go and try to lock what m1 and yes you can see that m1 was released then it can actually get the lock of m1 do its job and, and unlock m1 and m2 both don't worry about the order so these two are unlocked so as soon as you unlock m2 thread one was waiting for m2 right then it will get that lock and then it will try to lock m1 yes now you have actually completed your job thread two is already returned from here or at least it have not logged anything then m2 will also be logged or m1 will also be logged so thread one will also complete after this it will get m2 and m1 and this will also complete so you can see that this was the hardest scenario possible in this case so after understanding that example number one we can see example number two and this is also no deadlock situation so let's suppose these two threads are trying to acquire the lock of m1 m2 m3 in thread one and thread two have this strategy to lock the same mutexes here and this is a no deadlock situation why don't worry about the unit of all these th one two three four okay so thread one actually got the lock of m1 and thread two actually got the lock of m3 okay and then there is no issue because m3 is not logged and we'll assume there are only two threads in the system okay and then thread one will obviously go for m2 after this m2 and thread two will go for m4 no problem till now no problem after this let's suppose either of this will actually go ahead and let's suppose this one reached or tried to lock m3 first then actually thread 2 
try to log m1 we have to assume this m3 actually tried to be logged first by thread 1 and thread 1 saw that oh oh m3 is already logged by thread 2 actually m thread 1 doesn't know by which thread it is logged but it will get to know that okay it is already logged then in that case exactly it will release the log of 2 and 1 and as I said before the order was actually like this but we failed at this position now the new order would be yes the new order would be something like this let me draw it 3 1 2 and 4 and this is just my assumption that new order should be like this and actually lock will try to lock this one and it will wait for this one and as thread 1 have already unlocked m1 and m2 this thread 2 will go ahead and it will try to lock m1 exactly it will be able to lock it m2 exactly it will be able to lock this and thread 2 will do its job afterwards and then unlock all these four mutexes and as soon as it will unlock m4 sorry m3 we were waiting for m3 right here this will actually get the lock and then it will try to lock one two four and it will get lock for everything and this will also proceed so there is no deadlock in this but wait a minute this will have deadlock and we will see why and you can guess also because this lock function is totally different and this one is different and once this lock will be able to lock m1 and m2 without any issue it will think okay let's go ahead and once m3 and m4 will be allowed to be locked because no one is actually have locked them okay so as you can understand the scenario here whenever it will come for m1 and m2 it will think that okay it can be logged so it will lock m1 m2 both and let's suppose parallelly this one was also executed m3 was not logged by any thread right so m3 will get logged m4 will get logged and then simultaneously both will go for next line and here is the problem lock will wait for m3 because m3 was already logged and this lock will wait for m1 because m1 was already logged and they both will keep on waiting and this is a big deadlock so let's see the example and close this video so here i have taken the example number one which is something like this lock m1 m2 and then m2 m1 okay and this is very beautiful code and see we have two threads task one and task two and we will be looping through this lock m1 m2 and m2 m1 can you see the order m1 and m2 and m2 and m1 so this is a very beautiful scenario and don't forget to unlock it so let's quickly run this i have compiled it successfully and now if we i will just simply run this see actually it is running parallelly i don't know you are able to see this but it is actually running and task one and task two is getting printed so many times in loop okay i don't know you can see that or not let me just close this see i have braked it now you can see there are so many printf can you see this task a task b see now it is task a okay so did you feel there was any deadlock no there was no deadlock at all but i can show you the deadlock if you will not use this and let's hope we will get the deadlock because getting deadlock also in these days is not that easy you know because systems are so fast that they can execute in between that time span and you will not face deadlock and you might think that deadlock has gone from the computers but actually it is not okay so let's comment out this one and let's try to compile this okay compile successfully if i will execute this okay see it is static now it did executed some time maybe till good amount of time i don't know i am not able to reach that place see i have reached yeah see can you see this before actually i killed this task and then i executed this so it was actually running till so long time see after that after this a is changing here also okay now it is stuck here see nothing is refreshed so this is a deadlock and yes we can see the deadlock correct and one more thing guys this video was about locking multiple deadlocks so whenever sorry multiple mutexes and whenever you, there is a situation to lock multiple mutexes first thing you have to do is you have to lock them in the same order to actually avoid the deadlock but in some situations 
it is not possible then you can actually go with this kind of locks and there is another thing you have to unlock these things later because this will actually lock it it will not unlock it after using this one so if you don't want to unlock them you have to use either of the wrapper unique lock or lock guard but there is another wrapper which is called scoped lock which is in c plus plus 17 that i will explain you tomorrow okay and that is also very beautiful thing actually they have done one thing they have combined this strategy with love guard i mean it seems that they have done this so we'll see that tomorrow thanks for watching guys so if you really like the video please let me know in the comment section and do like the video if you like the video and subscribe for my channel if you want to see more content like this i'll see in the next video bye bye hello friend this is rupesh and you're watching cpp nuts video series on threading series and this is a future and a promise and this is really very interesting T let me tell you that and do you know why we are learning this actually when you have your main function and let's suppose this starts here and end here you create a thread here and you have your function which will act as a thread here so you will pass this function name here that's it right and now what happens let's suppose in coming future inside this main after creating this thread you want some value from this thread let's suppose this function did something and generated this value and you want this value here so we'll achieve this with the help of this future and promise so let's see how it actually works so for that just try to understand this particular program here the program is it will find odd number from 0 to this number okay i mean sum of the odds number so this is where we are creating thread and yeah you must be knowing how to create thread and what we are doing here okay i mean we are passing this find odd as a function parameter sorry function pointer so this thread will take this function and create a thread so our requirement is we want to find all the odd number sum between this zero and this number so this is your thread now here comes the magic what i said you want some value which was generated here so what is that value this is that value odd sum this is the value we need inside our main function or main thread right so there are two things first you will create a promise object another is you will create a future object from that promise object so remember this first thing is creating a promise object second thing is creating a future from that promise object so now there is a connectivity in between these two there is a state sharing between these two objects and what is that state you will pass this odd sum promise see we are moving it because we don't need this odd sum promise inside our main so what we are doing we are moving and taking this as a first parameter of your thread and once you have the value what you want to set so that main can get it you will set to that particular promise what we received from here and this is the way to set it see this is your value you want to send to this main you will set that value using that set value inside this promise now you created this future from this promise right what you send here now using that future can you see this we are getting the value and this is how it works have a promise object you send that promise to this thread and once you are ready with the value you will set that value to that promise and we created a future object from that promise and if we are asking the value it will get it now what are the possibilities here the possibility is maybe when you are asking the value that is not available so what we will do we will wait for the result so can you see this there is synchronization between these two threads this is let's suppose thread t1 because we created it and this is a main thread so what we did we created two object we created a thread we passed this odd sum and let's suppose this is taking three seconds just assume this will take three seconds 
and you know that as soon as you create this thread you will start executing your next statement right so you created this thread and it was at its zero second and you created I mean executed this one and when it was starting you created I mean you executed this one so what you did you're saying that is the value available on this particular future and this future was created on this odd sum so you are waiting for this statement to be executed but it will take three seconds so what you will do you will wait here this is what it is you are asking is it available if it is not available I'll wait here this is what it is and as soon as it will be available that value you will get here okay and it's that simple so can you see this you need two things one is promise which you will send to the thread and you will set this promise inside this thread promise dot set underscore value and you will set some value here what we are doing here and once you set this promise you at main at here at the future object which was waiting for this to be executed now once this is executed it will get that and another scenario is as I said this is taking three seconds but the time between this line and this line right now is very less I mean it will not take a fractions of second to reach this but maybe let's suppose in between these two line we are taking five seconds to reach maybe there is some job here we are doing which is taking five seconds so you created a thread which will generate a value in three seconds and set that promise but you asked after five seconds so what do you think what should happen exactly you will get that value immediately it's not like you will have to wait or something so here comes the parallel job if you would have not created this thread then the whole execution time was 5 plus 3 8 but now as soon as you create this thread which will take 3 seconds and you will take 5 seconds to actually use that threads value what was created so ultimately you have only 5 seconds and you are done and if this thread was not there you needed 8 seconds so the point here is if this futures promise is already set before actually it asks then it will directly get that it won't wait or something so let's run this program and sum this video so let's compile this compile successfully if we will execute it see it is waiting so wait is coming here and now the result is there and we have completed so let's quickly see how it is working we printed this we created a thread which is taking uh, let's suppose three seconds or a two second or three second we waited for three second I guess so it is taking three seconds and here we are waiting because you call this that's why you was waiting and this completed was not printed so once this value is available this got printed and this completed was also printed so you can understand this right you need only two things promise and the future promise you will send to the thread and send I mean set the value inside the promise and whatever future you created using that promise you will wait on that future to get that value through promise so promise is like a setter and this future is like a getter here so so I know you like the video don't forget to hit the like button guys and make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you will get the notification for upcoming videos like this and this is the channel where you will get C, C++, data structure, algo and design pattern and whatnot in future so consider subscribing we will enjoy together see you in the next videos bye bye hello guys welcome back this is Rupesh and I'm watching CPP Nerds video series on C++ and today's topic is std async so do you like a task based system or you uh, want to create a task or something if yes then this is for you so let's try to understand what i mean by task so you have your program running and what you want to do is just create a thread which will run parallelly and you will go ahead with your program so this is your thread let's 
call it a task and this is your main function for for now hey guys time for a quick pause and what you're seeing right now is my patreon page so if you don't know what is patreon it's a crowdfunding website where you can support any content creator like me and in return you get rewards so if you join me i can be your private tutor or you just want to chat with me and ask your doubts or maybe you just want to support me with very small amount and I'll still have something for you. So do visit my Patreon page and see if you like it. And if you want to discontinue anytime, you can do that. So if you have already visited my Patreon page, let's continue our video now. So you created a thread, it is running parallelly and this program is also running parallelly, okay? Now what happens, once this task is completed, you need a return value. Do you remember something about a, a promise and a future? video I gave last time maybe the day before yesterday yes so this time we are not going to use a promise here this promise will be taken care by this async internally so we are going to use future and this is very easy to achieve what we were achieving using promise plus future so we had to pass this promise to the task or a thread and there we used to assign the value inside this and that value will come to the future so this is what we were learning right so if you don't know what is promise and future i'll recommend please watch my previous video or you will get the link here if i am not showing link here please let me know in the comment section i mean i may forget right so promise and future and in this video as we are learning async we don't need this promise so let's go through the comments it runs a function asynchronously asynchronously means you know that right that function will also run and your main program will also run okay so simultaneously and potentially in a new thread so we are good now and returns a standard future that will hold the result so this is the key and the syntax is very easy believe me and we'll see that little later so it's obvious that if you'll use this async you would be able to create a thread it depends what launch policy you are using but for now you assume that we use async for creating a task or a thread which will do your job and return something and now the second point is there are three launch policies for creating tasks launch policies means you will somewhere write this async right so in bracket you will give here a launch policy means when you are launching this thread or task how to launch it so there is this first way async way another way is a deferred way so for simplicity you understand this that this async one is for threading i mean it will create a thread if you will pass the launch policy as async to this async function and in case of this deferred it will not create a thread and third one is you are saying that let the computer decide whether it should do this oh my goodness i just wrote two times this is deferred okay this is deferred here okay so now what we are doing is we are saying that computer please you decide whether you can make this task as deferred task i mean choose deferred if you cannot create a thread otherwise if you can create thread then choose this async what we are simply telling to the os that i know os this creating thread is a little heavy job and right now if you are able to do that i mean if you are able to create a thread please do it but if you are already overloaded i mean os is already overloaded then don't create a thread you create a deferred task and what do I mean by deferred task is not something else. It's just that whenever you will use the future to get the value, then only it will be called. Otherwise, it won't be called at all. Okay. I'll, I'll show you that example. Don't worry. So for now, just simply understand that async is create a thread and deferred is do not create a thread. Kind of a blocking call. So let's look at the program and we'll understand this better. So this is your program here. And the program is we will create a task this is a task creation and as i'm passing this deferred here we will not create i mean it will not create a thread we we saw that right and the program is you have to find the odd sum between zero to this number and this is how the function would look like do you see this return type and this return odd sum 
I mean, this is first time our thread, this is a thread creation or task creation. So first time we are able to return something from thread. Otherwise, always we were either sending some variable from here to get updated here or we were sending promise and waiting for the future. And this time, this is the cleanest way to actually return something from this function when we are using thread. So let's quickly run this program, run step by step. This is okay. This will print, no problem. Thread created if policy is launched async, but our policy is deferred, so it will not create. It will just execute this line and keep a bookmark whether I should call this function with these two values or not. It will just make a, what do you call it? I don't know. It will just make an entry with this find odd function name and these two parameters where this zero and this 19 number will be there. So it will make an entry here. It will run this command and it will run this one. So as soon as you hit this one, it will say that, okay, we are asking this future. It means we have to run this function to get this value. And now we'll be blocked here. And until unless this function returns something, we cannot move further. And let's suppose uh, your function takes three seconds. So we'll wait here for three seconds because we wanted that value, what we are supposed to get from this function. And we wait it and we will print it. We'll go to this one and we'll be done. So let's see that and we'll see how this async will work here. So let's compile this and see the results. So compile successfully. And if I'll execute this, see it is waiting for the result. And then the result is this one and we complete it. So you won't be able to see any difference. Actually, I can show you the difference with the thread ID print. And if I will make this async, then also the output would look similar and we will still be waiting for this result. But as soon as this hits, I mean, whenever OS is executing this line, it will create this task and start running this because it is async, it will start it immediately. It will not wait for someone to get that. And then only it will start. No, it is not deferred. It is async. It will start at this line itself. Okay. So let's compile this guy and see if it is working. Yeah. See the same wait here and we are done. So do, do you think this thread and this thread is different? Let's print that. So if I will, print thread ID, this thread. Okay. And the same goes here. Let's, so let me read on this. I mean, I just forgot this two brackets here and it was giving one and one. So that was super frustrating to find. Okay. So can you see this? We will be getting two different IDs. So first ID is this one, this 139 and another one is 139, but see the full number. This is 139701 something and this is something else. So can you see this? As we give this async, these two different IDs are coming. Means this main thread is running in different thread and this was executed as a task, as a different thread. Now let's quickly make this deferred. I know you wanted this. Let me compile this again and execute this. And this time you will see that both of the IDs are actually similar. Can you compare this 139? Just compare this 4352, 4352. So both was running in single thread means we did not create any thread. Actually, it's a lazy evaluation and eager evaluation. Eager means you will be using this async here. So this becomes eager. The moment this line hits, it will create a thread or a task and start that task. But in case of this as a deferred, it won't create a task. It will just create an entry of a task that in future, maybe I will have to create a task. And when it will create a task, when you will hit this get on this future. And as it will be running in the same thread means it is a blocking call or something. Okay. It is not creating a thread here in case of deferred. So that's what I wanted to convey here, guys. 
cool right so next time i want to see you using async whenever you need some behavior like this what we discussed here so i will sum this video now thanks for watching guys and make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you will get the notification for upcoming videos like this i will see you in the next videos take care bye bye hello friend this is rupesh i'm watching cvp net video series on threading and this video is about producer consumer problem and if you know threading what is threading in c and c plus plus or any other language you should be knowing this particular problem producer consumer problem so in this video we'll learn about what is producer what is consumer and why it is called problem and this is very important when it comes to the interview because so many people ask this question in interviews even i have asked the same question so many times and yeah the same problem is called bounded buffer problem so let's try to understand what is producer and consumer problem producer is also a thread and consumer is also a thread and you can visualize that producer is producing the data and consumer is consuming the data so they need a common buffer where they will do their operation meaning producer will produce the data and keep here so that consumer can take it from here now here is the problem okay this is a buffer yeah so the problem is see this is a common resource where this t1 thread and t2 thread are trying to access simultaneously this is a possibility that they will try to access this simultaneously and they will try to modify this buffer because producer is keeping the data meaning it will try to modify the state of the buffer and consumer is trying to remove the data so this is also going to modify the state of the buffer meaning they both are trying to access the same buffer at the same time then there is a race condition to avoid race condition we need a mutex let's have a mutex here now how it, how it will work producer will try to acquire the lock let's suppose producer got the lock and it created the data let's suppose this one is the data now producer will notify to the consumer after producing this data it will notify this to the consumer that i have produced something and if you are waiting for this you go ahead and consume it and before notifying producer have to unlock the mutex so let me repeat this again producer took the lock produced the data meaning you put one data into the buffer now you are saying to the consumer that you can consume it but before telling that you have to release this mutex lock and yeah this notification will happen with the help of condition variable so we need a condition variable also i'll show you the program how it will work don't worry about that so consumer get notified consumer came here and took the data from here so now there is no data let's remove this once consumer have consumed the same story will go ahead consumer will this time notify to the producer dude i am done with the use and if you have something to produce go ahead so this is the cycle which will keep on happening until unless producer stops producing meaning let's suppose producer wanted to produce from 0 to maybe 1 billion data it's just very small data then this consumer thread is always looking for the notification meaning someone have to wake up this consumer thread that okay the data have come start consuming so producer had this much of data producer started putting the data and started notifying to the consumer and consumer started consuming and notified back to the producer that if you have some more data please go ahead and produce it meaning produce some information and put into this buffer so that i can take it so this cycle will keep on going until unless producer run out of data and consumer will still wait for the notification so that if there are so many producer not only this let's suppose there is this is producer 1 maybe there can be n number of producers and they all are producing the data and only one thread which is consuming the data so maybe producer 1 is empty maybe producer 2 3 are still going on so they will notify to the consumer and consumer will start consuming the data what is coming from producer 2 producer 3 and till producer n Hey guys, it's time for a quick pause and what you are seeing right now is my Patreon page. So if you don't know what is Patreon, it's a crowdfunding website where you can support any content creator like me and in return you get rewards. So 
If you join me, I can be your private tutor or you just want to chat with me and ask your doubts or maybe you just want to support me with very small amount and I'll still have something for you. So do visit my Patreon page and see if you like it. And if you want to discontinue anytime, you can do that. So if you have already visited my Patreon page, let's continue our video now. Cool, right? So let's look at the program and some this video. So this is the producer consumer program. Here it is fairly simple program. What I have done is, see, this producer will take how much value it has to produce. So I'll pass how many values it has to produce. But consumer, I'm not passing anything. Consumer will run infinitely. So in while I have kept true here, meaning this while loop will go on till the program is not terminated. So it will run forever. So consumer is running forever as I explained and producer is having some data to produce. Okay. And the logic is, see, if I will give 10 here, meaning if I'm passing to the producer 10, then it will reduce till one. And once it becomes zero, this while loop will terminate. Let's look at the driver function. So this is your driver function. See, I have created T1 and T2. Producer is taking 100 and consumer is running infinitely. And I'm joining these two threads so that my main thread should not complete until unless these two threads are running. So T1 got created, producer got 100. Let's see how it is working. Here we have 100. Now we are using mutex and we are trying to acquire the log. If we are successfully able to acquire the log here, which is this mutex, and yeah, this mutex should be common for producer and consumer. I have seen so many people thinking that Producer will have its own mutex and consumer will have its own mutex. No dude, it is not possible. Then there is no point of having a single key to open a common place. And then why are we guarding that place with a single key? If multiple people can have the same key and go inside that, correct? Then there should be only one key among all the threads. If you want to synchronize all those threads for that particular data where you see race condition. Okay, so let's assume it acquired the lock here and now see I'm waiting on this condition variable. Not waiting, I'm checking a condition. Yeah, there should be a condition for producer and there should be a condition for consumer. What is that condition? The condition is, see, let's suppose your buffer size is maybe 100 or let's make it 50 for now. And this is the size of your buffer. You can at max put this much big number. I mean, these many data inside your buffer. So now producer will have a duty to check before producing whether this buffer is almost full. Meaning if it is from zero to 49 and the size of the buffer is 50, meaning I cannot produce it. So it will wait for consumer to consume and remove the data from buffer so that it can produce it. So before producing producer will check buffer is not full, right? Yeah. And similarly goes for the consumer. Consumer will check the buffer. It should be having at least one data. Your buffer size should not be zero. Then there is no point of consuming the data. So there are two conditions for producer. If your buffer is full, you will wait. And for consumer, if your buffer is empty, you will wait. So that's why I have kept this wait condition and on producer side, it is checking that your buffer size is less than maximum buffer size. Okay. So maximum buffer size, I told right 50. So your buffer size, currently your buffer size should be less than maximum buffer size so that you can produce something, meaning you can push something in your buffer. And let's suppose if this is not getting true, you will wait at this line only by releasing this particular mutex. And this ha happens automatically. If you don't know what is the use of condition variable and mutex and all that, you can go ahead and watch my videos. I have explained it so nicely. So let's assume we entered first time and this size is zero, meaning it is less than 50. We'll go inside this buffer dot push back. This 10 will go into this buffer. And then we are printing the message that, okay, produced 10. And now value is getting minus minus, meaning nine is the next value and then locker dot unlock and then we will notify to the consumer thread. So we are saying that notify one, we have another option. We can say notify all if there are so many consumers, but as we have only one consumer, we'll say notify one. So as soon as you say notify one, notify, I mean, consumer will get notified because see, 
if you notice here consumer is also waiting for this condition variable and you are using the same condition variable to notify so that's how consumer will get notified so this time as you have notified consumer will wake up because consumer would have slept here because your buffer size was not greater than zero initially both came because we created t1 and t2 thread so they both started both thread started and here this guy will be able to get into the producer and will be able to produce but the consumer will not be able to consume because initially your buffer is empty so both are coming here and both are checking this condition is getting true here but this condition is getting false so if it is getting false consumer is waiting but this one was able to produce so as i said now we got notified here and consumer will wake up and see okay buffer size is greater than zero yes because just now producer have produced one data now the buffer size is one one is greater than zero correct then we'll go ahead and remove the element from the buffer and remove and keep this value here and we are trying to print that value by saying that i have consumed it and the same thing i told you right we have to unlock this locker meaning this mutex and then we have to notify one we have to notify back to the producer dude you can start producing again because i have consumed it now there is a very big catch here i'm telling you open your eyes open your mind <laughs> okay this is not exactly how it is going to be because this is happening in loop the very first time producer produced it and unlocked locker condition variable was notified and this consumer was notified you know what is possible consumer is notified and just after that can you see this producer is going back in the loop and trying to reacquire the same lock what this consumer is also trying to lock now the possibility is after notifying to the consumer producer reacquired the lock and it went to this condition and saw that okay size is still one because till that time consumer did not consumed it and this will become true it will come inside again and by that time consumer was trying to get the lock only and then consumer reached and saw that oh this lock is again acquired then it will again sleep for this lock and this time value will become eight and you would have printed 9 value become 8 and you will do the same thing so this is the catch it looks like producer is producing one element and it is notifying to the consumer and then consumer is consuming that element no it is possible that in this loop producer is able to produce so many data and in between some time consumer is able to acquire the mutex and then consumer will be able to consume and number of data and then producer will get the log back so it's not like one element and one element it can be multiple elements it depends on the cpu that which thread is able to get the log fast it's just that simple so let me compile this compile successfully i'll execute it see let me expand this so how it started so from here we started produced 199 until 78 it was able to be in producer thread only meaning it was reacquiring the lock for these many time and just after that see now consumer get the lock see consumed 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 and then consumer till 100 it consumed successfully how much this producer was produced it consumed totally that many time and then after that producer got the lock because consumer was not having any data so it did not try to reacquire the lock it went for sleeping because of this condition this one because see it consumed 100 which was produced first meaning there is no further data into the buffer so that's why this consumer thread was sleeping because of this size should be greater than zero but size is zero and then see producer produce the data but it could produce only four see this time it was able to produce only four data and then consumer was able to consume this four data and then again producer started producing and this time it was able to produce maybe seven one two three four five six seven yeah seven times and then consumer started and consumed for seven times 
So because of this while loop here, there is a race for this mutex. Who is able to get this mutex so quickly because both are running into the loop. So this is how it will work. And I'll show you this theory. You can pause this video and see all these things. It is just a problem statement is like producer will produce and consumer will consume with synchronization of a common buffer. Whatever I have explained, these are there in the theory part. And the important point is producer and consumer have to notify each other upon completion of their job. This is very important job. So once producer have produced something, it will tell to the consumer that dude, you can start consuming and the same thing will happen. If consumer have consumed something, it will tell to the producer that you can start producing. So there is a synchronization. They will do their job, but they will notify each other. Then only this will work. And this is the actual producer consumer problem. If you're not notifying each other, then this is not a producer consumer problem. So I hope you would have liked this video. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next videos. Take care. Bye bye. Hello friend. This is Rupesh and I'm watching CPP Nuts video series on in short programming stuffs where I generally cover small, small things about the programming, which often confuses people. So if you want to see the full list, you will get in the description field. And in this video, I am going to give you a real life example in the end. So don't miss this video. Watch it full till the end. If you do not want to forget this ever again. So let's try to understand what is sleep and wait. They both are related to thread, meaning sleep and wait, they both will make your thread not runnable, meaning it will not run. So if I would say this is a CPU here and we have T1 and T2 and they both are running on this CPU. If you'll apply sleep or wait, they both will go to some non runnable state. Okay, let's assume that there is an entry where if you will keep these two threads, CPU will not bother about these two threads. Okay, so it's like a non runnable threads. So let's try to understand with this beautiful line I got somewhere in the internet. So you call sleep and it's something like this. I am done with my time slice. And please don't give me another one for at least n milliseconds. So whenever you say sleep, so in C++ it's like sleep underscore four, and you give some number here, like say thousand, thousand milliseconds. So you say that I'm a thread and I'm going to sleep for thousand milliseconds and don't give me anything before that. Whereas weight is little different. It says I'm done with my slice. I mean time slice, don't give me another time slice until someone call notify or notify all. I just forgot to write that. Okay, so notify and notify all. So do you see the difference? Wait is like, dude, I'm going to wait, but someone has to come and notify me. Okay, sleep is like, dude, I'm going to sleep for this much time. And then I will automatically wake up here. It is like, you have to call me to wake me up. This is very big difference. There are other difference and points too, but this is very big difference. Sleep is like, I'll sleep for this much of time. Wait is like, I'll keep on waiting until unless someone pokes me with the help of notify or notify all function. Clear, right? Okay, so I think I'm repeating again, so it's clear now. So let me just read these lines the os doesn't even try to schedule the sleeping thread until requested time has passed that's what i said and in case of wait as with sleep the os won't even try to schedule your task unless someone calls notify or notify all so this is clear till this line now let's go for these points so point number one for sleep is like, it will keep the lock and sleep. Oh my God, this is disastrous. You know, if you do this, meaning there was a critical section, there were a race T1, T2, T2 acquired the lock. Okay. And somewhere here it is sleeping. This T1, sorry, T1 acquired the lock and T1 is sleeping. It is not going to release the lock so that T2 can start working on this condition. I mean, critical region. Let's suppose T1 took it and it is sleeping for maybe one hour. This is like, oh my God. <laughs> this critical section is blocked and no one can use it. 
because T1 acquired the lock because it was critical section. So you cannot allow two or more than two threads to do the same or execute the same set of instructions. So you had some lock here in the beginning and you acquired the lock. You went inside and you slept. It's like <laughs> disastrous, okay? Like T3 also, like there can be n number of threads waiting for this critical section to get free so that they can start using it. But hey, <laughs> T1 is acquired the lock and it is sleeping for one hour. We are done. But no one do this. If they are doing it, meaning they don't know the programming or they at least don't know what is the basics of sleep. Okay, so that's what it is. You will not use sleep if you have not released the lock. Whereas in wait case, it releases the lock and wait. So this wait is very good. So now assume the same T1 came and it started waiting. Then waiting meaning it has released the lock. What it acquired here, it released the lock and now it is waiting. The moment it goes for waiting, it's like there is no hour or something. I will wait for some hour and all that. No, it will just go for the wait. Okay, some condition variable sorry, condition variable dot wait, you will do this and you will go for wait. The moment you go for wait, this tiny little function will actually release this lock automatically and it will be assigned, I mean, freed for others. So other can come and lock this critical section and do their job. Unlike this one hour sleep kind of thing, which was a blocking thing. This is non-blocking. Okay. Now, second point, sleep is directly to thread. It is a thread function. Okay. So if you remember in C++, how we do, it's like STD, this thread, and we say sleep for, and then we pass the number here. Correct. So this thread, and this comes from header called thread. So do you see you're not accessing any object? And you're calling this function, meaning this is kind of a static function, which is actually directly applied to the thread. But when you're calling wait, it's like condition variable dot wait. So you wait on some object here, which you created, uh, like, let's suppose you have this function one and you want to treat this function as a thread. So you will create this condition variable somewhere here, like STD condition variable CV, something like that. And in down the line somewhere, you will wait on this condition variable. Wait. Sorry for the writing here, but you got the point, I guess. Now, I think it's the time to give that bonus real life example of this sleep and thread. So let me write this sleep. So what is the classical example of three sleep? Sorry. <laughs> and wait. Sleep is like actual sleep, you know, when you have a job, like I do a job, so many people do daily job. I mean, my job is like nine to five. If you consider that I do this much of work and I come home and I sleep. Okay, good. Yeah. But when I'm sleeping, I'm acquiring the lock lock of what no one is working on behalf of me. If you see it like this, my computer, my desk is empty. No one is typing code there, right? Because I have acquired the lock and currently I am sleeping. This work is not moving. It's not moving because I am sleeping. In another hand, wait, wait is like there is some interview going on in some company. So this is interviewer and this is interviewee. And this is like critical section. You cannot go inside. You have to wait here. So many people are waiting here. Correct. Now, here is the reception. If this guy is gone, meaning he is done with his interview, this guy would tell to the receptionist that please send some another guy. So we all are waiting like T1, T2, T3 till Tn. We all are waiting. We all are thread. We all are waiting for this particular critical region. And what this receptionist would do? She might pick some random resume from these resumes and call your name. Maybe this guy would go this time. So if she says notify one, meaning somebody would go. Okay. 
So like we have two functions, right? One is notify and another one is notify all. So if she notifies, either of this will go. If she says notify all, meaning guys run, you guys run and whoever will actually reach to this gate faster will get the entry and rest have to come back and start waiting again for my signal. This is the classic example I could think for this wait and sleep. And if you will ask anybody, no, they will say, hey, sleep is like it will actually hold the lock and sleep. Wait is like you will release the lock and you will wait. And both are like not using the CPU until their time comes. And their time comes when this time is over for sleep and this notify or notify all is coming for these waiting threads. So this is the difference. And can you associate it is not locking? Meaning this wait is not locking, meaning this guy is waiting here, but this critical section is still being used by somebody else. This thread or this thread or this thread. But this is not the case with this guy. I am coming back to my home and I'm sleeping. No one is doing my job. This critical section is like done. <laughs> so this is what I can think of. Thanks for watching guys. Thanks for your support. Love you. Bye bye. I'll see you in the next videos. Take care.